Howard from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the Drew Estate Studios in California. It's episode 301 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome Vlada Stojanov of Psalm Cigars, making his debut on the Primetime Show. And as always, the Primetime Show is brought to you by Saga Cigars. De Los Reyes introduces another chapter of Saga, Saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work and the spirit of the standing ideal of owning your own journey and making your own saga. Saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. Saga Celez covers a blend of Coyote Allure and Peloto Cubano, wrapped in a selected Ecuador shade Claro wrapper that generously delivers with elegance, a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in four sizes at an affordable price. Ask your retailer for Saga Celez. And by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobacco that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel aged wrappers with thick, high priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigars is a family owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in S3, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo 30th Anniversary, Perdomo Double H 12 Year Vintage, Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Line, Perdomo Abano Bourbon Barrel Aids, Perdomo Lot 23. Perdomo Imenso 70 and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the Perdomo website at perdomocigars.com. And we want to mention Cavalier Cigars. Cavalier Cigars, Cavalier Cigars, smoke gold and stay gold. Join the inner circle and follow Cavalier Cigars on Instagram at Cavalier underscore cigars. And on Facebook, Cavalier Geneva Cigars. That's Geneva, G-E-N-E-V-E. Visit your local tobacconist and join the movement that is Cavalier Cigars. They're consistently regarded highly by cigar lovers everywhere, as well as high ratings by the cigar industry press. You'll want to follow them on Instagram again at Cavalier underscore cigars because they do some very unique giveaways throughout the whole year. Cavalier Cigars, smoke gold and stay gold. And finally, by Drew Estate. Dark, bold, and unapologetic. Black and Cigars M81 by Drew Estate is an intense journey into the uncharted, deepest, darkest, and heaviest depths of Maduro tobacco. This is a masterpiece collaboration between Metallica's James Hetfield, Sweet Amber Still- Stilling's Rob Dietrich, and Drew Estate's Jonathan Drew. The all Maduro Black and Cigars M81 by Drew Estate is rich and powerful, but beautifully balanced, offering tantalizing notes of leather, chocolate, and espresso. That's perfect for life celebrations and times of reflection. You can find them at your Drew Diplomat retailer. And remember, all the live streaming for the Primetime Network of Shows, as well as the Thursday studio for the Primetime Show, sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 301. Today is Thursday, April 4th, 2024. Will Cooper, back here in the Perdomo Scott Studios, and joined by my good friend and colleague, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How are you doing tonight, Will? Doing, doing good. Uh, you were missed, Aaron. We, uh, we, you definitely were missed. Uh, when we were out of PCA. Uh, Sounds like you had no used, excitement. We, we could have used me. you. We actually could have <laughs> used you in a few instances. <laughs> your expertise, your counsel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your leadership. <laughs> and um, to carry the stuff around. That's important, right? That's, like that's true. Exactly. Exact. Well, that, no, that's Bear's job. Bear carries my stuff around. <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> But uh, but Aaron, yeah, great, great to have you back here. Um, and uh, you know, I'm glad we're uh, glad we're able to, you know, we're, we're picking up the we're picking up a 301 right now. So this is exactly. this is exciting. Perfect. So so yeah, why don't we just introduce our guest right now? Let's introduce yeah. uh, Vlad right now. Um, uh, Vlad, welcome to prime time, my friend. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I actually have a couple of friends watching this, and they've been texting me. So if it did get picked up, I'm sorry about that. But I do got to give out my uh, my friend Tyler from Smoke Ring down in Houston, uh, also one of uh, our selected retailers in that area. So hi, buddy. Thank Absolutely. you for that beautiful compliment that I can't share with the audience because <laughs> it, we got to keep it PG. Oh, boy. Well, we actually don't, <laughs> but uh, not regulated by the, the FCC here. So we're in good shape with that. Uh, uh, no, but seriously, <laughs> thank you for having me. I, I love listening to the show. And you mentioned, 
you primarily download it. I usually use it on my trips to California where it's a four hour drive. I'll grab a couple yeah. episodes and just, uh, just, uh, you know, listen from, uh, while enjoying a cigar. No. And, uh, you know, I, I know we actually met last year at the trade show yep. and for the first time face to face, and I've gotten to know you through email and we had a, I, I think a bet, you know, uh, we spent a little more time at the trade show this year, uh, which was really good. So, um, I know we were talking about getting you and I said, look, uh, right after PCA, we, we, we'll, we'll give you, we offered you the first slot and you were able to get it. So I, here we are. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Super excited. Um, yes. great. So I, I love that you're, uh, you're enjoying the Corona Gorda. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to, to smoke it, that basically sold out, um, essentially instantly. Um, it was released back in February. Um, well, let me take a step back. So the Somme brand in general, um, relies heavily on my, on my, uh, wine background. I'm a, I'm a Somm, which is effectively a wine expert. But aside from that, I've worked with cigars since essentially 09. I've gone through the Habanos training. I've, you know, studied the Tobacconist University, read a bunch of books, visited a bunch of factories, countries, et cetera, smoked, you know, a few cigars along the way, uh, both on the, the new world, if you're in Europe, as they call it, which is essentially everything we get to enjoy uh, on this market. And then obviously I worked the Cuban portfolio when I was, when I was in Europe, um, I oversaw at 1.5 different humidors, uh, in very different, very different, uh, stages. So it's kind of an interesting thing to have that, uh, to have kind of a view of, of, of both sides of the world, if you will. Sure. Sure. Actually, you know what I want to ask you? We always like to ask a, a question is, do you yeah. remember your first cigar experience? And Absolutely. I that to us. I'll Absolutely. How could you forget? That's a, uh, we'd that's, be surprised. A, um, it's such a, uh, I guess, formative experience. You either fall in love with it right off the bat, uh, or you don't. And I really, I lucked out in retrospect. I really, truly lucked out. Uh, my first cigar was a Cuban punch punch. Um, this was during my Psalm, uh, introductory training, which took six weeks. So, uh, with, my mentor, essentially, we had two days that were just focused on cigars. So the first day was four hours of just theory. Uh, and that kind of gave a good basis because a lot of the stuff from the wine world, uh, almost I don't want to call it directly translates, but a lot of it, you can make comparisons very, right. very clearly. Um, and again, uh, the, the way he approached that first cigar was, you guys don't have to smoke it if you, if you choose not to. This isn't part of the test. Essentially, you need to know the basics, right? The wrapper, binder, filler. Um, and you need to know these eight or nine brands that were present on the market. And this is this is just part of your tool set, right? Where in Europe you can you can smoke cigars. Um, back then actually you could still smoke it indoors. So um, this is just part of your tool set, another revenue stream, another profit center, and you need to have at least a working knowledge on how to pair these things. So we had a pairing with uh, sparkling wine, which in my opinion is still one of the easiest like catch-all pairings. Uh, we had it a pairing, an alcoholic pairing with soda. Um, we we did port, obviously, which is such a classic pairing, and then a couple of different whites and reds, and then obviously spirits. So it was like bourbon, scotch, uh, rum, cognac, uh, and I believe there was a reposado tequila. Mind you, this is 15 years ago, so sure. if I'm missing something, like bear with me. Uh, but essentially, that that Cuban punch punch was a was an introduction to the world. Um, I really fell in love with it because much like wine, uh, if it's properly blended and it and properly done, taken care of uh, from from seed to essentially you lighting it on fire, um, it's one of the cheapest ways to travel. It'll just grab you by your hand and say, "Hey, let me show you where I grow, how I'm how I've been treated so far, what my journey was like. Um, you know, let me take you on a little trip." Right. And uh, that Cuban punch punch was basically a medium body, medium strength, medium finish. Um, so anything lighter than that ended up being lighter, anything fuller than that ended up being fuller, and you could pair accordingly. So I do remember like very, I can't tell you exactly what the profile was because it was 15 years ago and I've probably right. smoked a ton of those since then and they've changed quite a bit, but um, that was a really, really great introduction to the to the cigar world. So so this was what you were doing your, you know, your SOM mm -hmm. training basically. That this happened. Yes. Yeah. Dad. Uh, so I, I was really, really lucky. My dad's been enjoying cigars since um, 92. Uh, and his favorite cigar is uh, uh, Roman Giulietta number two. Right. Uh, that's just, that's just, 
has been his go-to for decades at this point. Right. And uh, after that first, my first cigar. So uh, I've never smoked cigarettes in my life. And, you know, Europe is a, the, the prevalence of sm cigarette smokers is a lot higher in Europe than it is in the U.S. Um, I've never, that like, that never appealed to me. Um, when I tried that first cigar, I could make a direct comparison to the wine side of it. Right. So it's kind of like it spoke to a romantic side of me, if you will. Yeah. And, and it worked really, really well. Yeah. I, um, it's interesting because my dad was a cigarette smoker. Um, not too much of a cigar smoker, an occasional, I think more because of me later on, because I started smoking in 2007. So not much longer. And, uh, but, as I was tolerant to cigarette smoke, because I grew up with it, right? So I was able yeah. to just like we, my dad and I, we'd go out in the yard and we'd have, I'd have a cigar, he'd have a cigarette, and uh, he'd give me a cigarette occasionally. I a lot I could I couldn't smoke it. It was like it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just, I agree. There's, yeah, it was, it was horrible. Um, I tried. I'm like I don't like this. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. Never. Not even. Yeah. Just never really appealed to me. Yeah. It it didn't work. Yeah. Um. I like the the artisanal aspect of the cigars the story right. the blending right all the yeah. all the intricacies both uh tangible and intangible that comes with the cigars now before you were doing sommelier and before you were doing wines or, or cigars were you doing anything else in life um, you know, any other businesses so no i i started uh i went from high school and, and the schooling is a little bit different in in europe compared to right. the u.s so i went what is my high school version was essentially, it's called a gymnasium, but it, what really uh, happens there, you have two different sets uh, where you can either focus on life sciences or you can focus on humanities. And as as your you know, four years go by, if you're focusing on humanities, you end up losing the life sciences and vice versa. Right, right. Mine was one of the few general ones where you basically have all four years of like chemistry, physics, all of these things. Like I had two years of Latin, two years of philosophy, psychology, all of these different things. Um, and it was one of the three or four schools in the country uh, because I was a I was an athlete. Uh, I'm a former rower. Um, and one of the requirements in order to attend this school was you have to be an athlete at a you know, semi-professional level. Um, I just dropped my cigar. Nobody saw, right? No, I didn't um, see it. So I, I trained effectively. I would have um, between six to 12 practices a week, depending on what's going on while going to school full-time. So after that, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to initially go to med school. Uh, both my parents were our doctors and um I've I've never seen my parents so unified where both of them at the same time said, please God no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and if, if you recall, kind of that early, like mid to late 2000s was really there was the little pop of uh, celebrity chefs and and things yeah. like that, like Gordon Ramsay and like that's coming uh, becoming a little bit more prominent. And uh, I've always loved food. My my parents have entered have always entertained people. Uh, regularly at the house and my mom would always cook. My dad would like, I can see, I can see the process right now. You would come <laughs> in right off the bat. My dad would welcome you. My mom would probably be in the kitchen, still prepping, offer your drink, sit down, have a little, you know, have a cocktail or two, have a snack. And then it would be a, a proper like couple of hour long uh, dinner. Yeah. You know? And uh, I kind of said, okay, well, I want to be a chef. And they said, great. Like we fully support it. I think it's a great idea. Why don't you go ahead? So um, I ended up working on the weekends while still in high school. Uh, I ended up working on the weekends in a restaurant, started as a dishwasher, uh, working for free, by the way, because it was a stage. Oh, wow. <laughs> and if anybody has ever worked in a, in a restaurant as a dishwasher, it is the hardest, most grueling mm -hmm. like job there is, I think, the, the one that I've <laughs> ever had. Um, and quickly about three months in, I think I got promoted to a, uh, um, prep cook. And mm -hmm. I was very, very happy. And <laughs> day one, uh, I think I got hit with like a hundred pounds of shrimp that I needed to devein. And, uh, <laughs> to this day, like I can eat shrimp, but I just, I very rarely order it. I can still, I can still smell the shrimp that got into my pores and just, I took like three showers and I could still smell it. And I'm like, okay, well, cool. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Yeah. Um, so I came in the following day. That was a Sunday. In fact, I still remember it. 
Um, I walked in super happy and I had to peel like a hundred pounds worth of potatoes. So, oh man, um, really it was, it was incredibly, you know, it was an incredible experience. Um, so I did that for about, I think like five or six months and, uh, about a month before the introductory exam to the, to the culinary school, right. To the college, uh, or hotel, hotel management college, um, uh, my dad, my dad still hunts. Uh, and actually, I broke down an animal, so he hunted a boar, and I ended up basically, you know, breaking down an animal, uh, which was great, right, from a learning perspective. And uh, I went to the school, and they just looked at my 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 prior schooling and said, "Well, you can't apply for the culinary arts program." So I was kind of devastated because I really wanted to become a cook or a chef, rather. And uh, I said, "Well, okay, what I what can I do instead?" They go, "Well, you can do you can apply for hotel management." And six months afterwards, you can you can transfer. And I'm like, okay, well, it's a month before the entrance exam. Like, what are the what are the requirements? They go, it's English. Um, struggled a little bit with that guy. So it was English, uh, general education, and like two other things. I forget what it was, but basically aced it, got a full scholarship ride, and then I figured out that I can strut around in my suit uh, rather than being you know uh, logs in the back peeling hundred pounds worth of shrimp. Uh, and, and then I, I did the, uh, did the SOM exam at, at 18 or 19, I think it was my first year of, of college, uh, did that, then did my internships in the States and it all kind of came together and I just kept learning, learning, learning and experiencing stuff. So I really fell into the hospitality side of it without, um, without a lot of intention, if you will. Got it. Hmm. Yeah. So you you were working in this hospitality and uh, originally maybe more on the wine side. Did you did you start to get in? You, but you were smoking cigars. When did you actually start to get uh, um, turn, like sm cigar smoking into getting into the business? Uh huh. So um, from that first cigar, right? I went from you know smoking one cigar a year, which was really that one, to right. like one every six months, to one every three months, to one every month, to so what essentially happened? around like twenty thirteen. I want to say was when I really dove into it. But between then, I did three internships in the States. And just from a knowledge thirst perspective, um, when I landed here in, in 2009, 2010, um, that was before, yeah, you, I could buy them legally. I remember that. Uh, I could buy cigars legally because it wasn't 21 until, what, two years ago. Um, I essentially just ordered a bunch of stuff. And, I, and I've and i ordered everything from CI samplers to, to like Opus. Right, just because I didn't know any better, and and when you go back in 2010, there wasn't a plethora of information. You look at the blend info, and it was like wrapper Dominican, binder right. Dominican, filler Dominican. Be like, well, this doesn't like tell me anything really. So I I kind of approached it from a yeah from an inquisitive standpoint. I said, look, well, let me smoke 30 Dominican cigars and at least figure out what can I expect from the profile. And this right. was mostly driven by. Um, because I, I lived in Serbia and the only three things that were available aside from Cubans on the market, it was a little bit of Davidoff because they were the, their distributors. Um, I think like six, may, maybe eight skews of Fuente mm -hmm. and uh, like a couple of Rockies. And, and that was it, you know, 20 or 14 years ago. Uh, now it's obviously a much different, like you can find uh, maybe not all the big brands, but most of them. Like there's mm -hmm. Placencia, there's you know Drew Estate, uh, there's Perdomo, and maybe Perdomo isn't on market, but like you can find things like that. Alec Bradley, Fonte, right. and and full, I mean like full skews, like you can find all the way up to Opus, including like I'm sure that you can find some like Casa Cubas, and you know not something that's like generally and easily right. available. And yeah, really, just, that's how it started. Um, no different than wine. Like let me try everything that's not available on my market and mm -hmm. learn. Right. And then eventually you started working in the in the cigar mm -hmm. business. So, so how did that yeah, kind of sorry, that, was, that kind of led to it? So yep. twenty yep, no um I got headhunted essentially to start as a SOM for this uh this uh, project in Montenegro that ultimately ended up growing into a regional restaurant company. And we essentially went from within a span of like two years from a single unit to like 15 different ones and uh where i oversaw like five different humidors at that point for i i don't like i'm a little bad with the years but i think it was like two years uh where essentially we had a humidor that was just targeted like a fine dining restaurant right so obviously we weren't offering 
ten dollar Cubans, like it was just all Cohibas, Bihike, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, then you, we had a luxury marina, which kind of had the same profile. Like you could have the regional editions, the limited editions, things like that. And then you had an all day dining club. So all of these different outlets required a different approach, and ultimately offering something for the for the market uh, that they were targeting. Uh, and then in 2017. Uh, I set up my distribution company and brought a European brand um, and essentially expanded it from there, like took over that distribution and, okay. and just kind of work on that up until uh, 2022, 2023 with them. Mm -hmm. Took that from essentially zero stores to, I think the height of it was like 180 stores, um, brought some more brands along the line, uh, along the way. And then ultimately, as those relationships changed, um, I decided to just make some it, its own standalone full full on brand. Um, and it essentially, it was it was supposed to be like a little celebration of relationships and and partnerships and friendships, um, which is kind of why the first cigar that that was released was a um, kind of came strong out of the gate with that one. <laughs> yeah, it was the Premier Crew from uh, Hel uh, Hendrik Kellner Jr. Um, that had over fifty plus years worth of tobacco. That was like two years. Mm -hmm. trying to like actually put it together and then uh you know made 3000 cigars cuz that's what the two bales essentially tran like transformed into and that came and went and to this day I'm I'm mad at myself for not saving some um there's four that I know of my dad has them in in Europe unless he already smoked them <laughs> I was going to ask you if they're still around actually uh, um, I've heard I, of this I've heard of this cigar yeah but I've not had it yeah so I found uh uh, I'm going to give the shout out to to this beautiful store that have, we've been friends since, I don't want to say day one they've opened, but very, very early on, probably within their first like six months. It was Smoker's Abbey in, in their original Austin location. Right. Uh, when they moved to the new one, uh, we did the unofficial launch uh, of that cigar. We we hosted a really, really beautiful dinner. Um, everything they ordered, they sold out and they asked me if they can get a little bit more. So they did. And in true prescient fashion, that, that they do, they actually put away, I believe, five or 10 boxes and saving for the next time I'm, I'm, I'm coming down and, and doing another event. And uh, I ended up snagging two boxes from them. So, uh, and again, in true fashion, rather than hoard them, um, I gave them out to friends and family that I ran into in, in Texas. So uh, right. I did, I did smoke one out of those 10. Yeah. I'm a big believer that like, the the cigars are meant to be enjoyed um, in a social like yes absolutely right. you can enjoy it by yourself and it's a beautiful form of meditation and yoga uh, for your for your mind but it is a social experience and if you can improve or enrich someone's life like you should especially you know by putting something on fire right right the so Sam formed while you were still doing this distribution right that mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. yep yeah. what year did it form. Uh, 2023, I guess, last oh, year. Okay, the, so it's still pro bro, dude, um, still bro, dude, Yeah, it's, yeah, it's that's super, super fresh. Yeah, that's why I thought, I was like, yeah, I just want to make sure I, I didn't miss anything. And um, I, 2022, I, bro, I'm, no, 2020, no, TP last, honestly, I don't even know at this point. I'm going <laughs> to, no, 2022, 2022, that's right. It wasn't um, before I, the I pandemic really, uh, then. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, 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 it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't. I, okay. and, and again, I have to, like, this was supposed to act as a little incubator for the brands that I I I, dis I distributed and worked closely with, right, mostly as a way to protect the brands, yeah. right. I would do it. This is Vlad's interpretation of this particular factor or something, and then if it hits, like we we take it from there. Yeah. But essentially, that was that was kind of the initial idea. Yeah. Um. I've done like no marketing, not nothing. It was basically yeah. like, hey, this is something that Vlad made. Like, hope you guys like it. And if yeah. you don't, I have enough cigars to smoke that I enjoy. That's it. Um, luckily everybody liked it. So I think year one with three skews and ended up being almost 50 something thousand cigars. So right. not a, not a bad, no. not a bad move considering I didn't really do anything apart from, Hey, it's this bald Serbian guy. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, when I was reading about the premier crew, I was, I was really fascinated with this cigar because you, one, you were making it obviously at uh KBF, but there was some, it was like a it was a very different blend um in that you were using Dominican wrapper but you were like working with this African hybrid filler correct on this yeah. thing 
yeah, yeah talk the, about the, a little it's... talk about a little bit this particular blend because this seems like it's right up your alley as far as you know what you were talking about earlier on as far as like wanting so, to know about these different tobaccos <laughs> i gotta be um i gotta be fully fully transparent here uh -huh. so out of everything in the portfolio that's the only cigar i didn't blend i picked that one that what, was you, made yeah, okay, by that's Hendrick for me and, okay, and i do want to like full like full disclosure i'm a big uh -huh. believer in transparency and i don't know well, like we're master blenders right. i'm not like Kellner made this for me. Right. Um, that BVS um, African hybrid was something new that he got, and I, and he put it in one of the two blends. And essentially, profile wise, think of Esteli Viso without as much strength. Um, okay. Kind of Esteli Viso meets Cameroon, but without as much strength. Uh, very interesting, super chocolatey, a touch of spice, everything but the kitchen sink. I still have the pairing notes or the tasting notes rather for the for Premier Crew. And that was very interesting. And it was a right. 2017, uh, if I remember right. So it was at that point, it was five years uh, young. Right. I'm not going to call it old because it wasn't. It, it was right. really young. Um, something very interesting. And when I asked Hendrik, hey, you know, like, tell me about this. He's like, I don't know. One guy imported. I tried it. It's the quality is there. Right. Um, it's, it's, re it's aged. Um, it hits all the quality marks that I'm looking for. And, you know, I think it fits. Um, and it was funny actually tasting that blend. Um, for those of you who have ever had a chance to try wine out of a barrel, it is very similar to creating those blends, right? You have to wade through the, <laughs> the disjointedness of it and say, okay, this is this is potential. What is it going to be six months from now? That's right. that's really, or a year from now or five years from now, right? Like you're looking at the potential. And I remember smoking these cigars. So typically, um, I'm sure plenty of people have talked about this on the show. Typically, you'll, you'll smoke the first like inch and say, okay, well, I kind of know where this is going and call it a day. Right. Instead, uh, we approached it with smoking the full cigar, start to finish. We smoked it all the way down, not talking, not imparting, um, because again, that can paint your perspective. So we smoked it. I took all the notes. We finished it. Three of us kind of came together and were like, hey, yes, no, pay, perhaps maybe I really like blend number one. And then I tried blend number two with that uh, BVS in there, which was the the only addition between, it was a switch from the uh, Esteli, Esteli uh, Viso that was in there. The swap was to the BVS hybrid. And I smoked it and I go, right, we didn't talk. I smoked it all the way down and I go, I think... Um, the first one was ready. Like the first one, you could just smoke it freshly rolled right then and there. The second one, Hendrik, I think, uh, I think this is a lot more potential. And he goes, right. I didn't want to say anything, um, right. As, as a proper teacher should like, let you make your own mistakes. He's like, I didn't want to influence you, but you're right. The second one has a lot more complexity, a lot more potential, and it'll ultimately be a better cigar. So True enough, he made 10 of them. I smoked them on the 26th. So my birthday is 26th of February. I smoked one every month, every 30 days. And in August of 2020, um, ultimately, I was like, yep, this is it. And uh, that kind of got put into production and then waited and wasn't released until 2020. Got so, it. 2022, sorry. Yep, yeah, nope, got it. And um, it was a one and done, basically. So mm -hmm. we're not going to see. Is it because of tobaccos? Is it yes. Just, okay. Uh, there was a, a wrapper from 1997 right. uh, that was used for it. Then there was the first, um, I don't know if there's any more of that 2007 binder right. from uh, Monte Plata, which is essentially Yamasa, mm -hmm. as we know it today. Um, and I believe that was the first time anything was ever grown up there and the first harvest. So um, very much on the cutting edge for for both of those. And it was interesting to, to try a 25-year-old rapper at that point that is not only alive but is kicking right. and screaming <laughs> nice nice you um you work with kbf you you work with eladio you work with any other factories yeah so ftc right cavalier which you highlighted so oh that's so right that's right have a, yep um, that. they make two of the regular production blends they've yep. been um i'm i'm good yep. friends with both brian and, and sebastian yep. and i've been to the factory i i don't do any of the uh, when I when I decide to make a blend, I'll fly down there and I'll spend at least a week and yep. try to figure it out. Right. So the the first cigar, the BDX, which is short for Bordeaux, right? Uh, shorthand, right? Basically, I just assume when when assoms are lazy, we'll right. just 
abbreviate it. <laughs> so uh, that one highlights Honduran Broadleaf. And in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a different brand because that's that's what really made me go to Honduras. Um, when the Cosecha 149 released, okay, um, I I met the rep somewhere. I want to say it was Midwest. Uh, they gave it to me, right? Like right. took the bands off, gave it to me, and and you know, kind of like as a test. They're like, try this. Let me know what it is. Touched it out, did the feeling, lit it up, smoked it, and I'm like, all right, cool. Like if I have to guess, this is Nicaragua, and if I have to be super specific, yeah. it's probably Placencia. <laughs> Right. Um, and they start, uh, he started, both of them, the, the store manager and, and him started laughing. And they're like, you're right about everything, except that's an old Honduran Puro. I'm like, no way. Really? He pulls out the text sheet and I'm like, I need to Oh, the 149, the 149. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That is what we over. Yeah. Yeah. And I really, really fell in love with it. So when I was down there, I essentially asked, you know, Brian and the guys like, what's interesting, what's new. So they did the right thing. And I have pictures somewhere, you know, took out 13, 15 different tobaccos in the blending table. And again, I approached it very inquisitively, very nerdy, sat yeah. down, smoked each of those things multiple times, just took notes. The first two days, I think I did nothing but just take notes. Um, and then at one point we were sitting at this table and I'm like, cool, it, like, I think I have an idea where I want to go. So took San Andreas for the, for the wrapper, took Viso Jalapa for the binder, took Honduran Broadleaf, uh, Viso Jalapa, and then San Andreas in the filler and made the worst looking roll of all, all time. Like it resembled a diploma <laughs> that wasn't properly rolled, like absolutely as horrendous. Um, put that right. Like tried it. The draw was like a wind tunnel, lit it up, took a couple of puffs. And I'm like, Hmm. All right. Pass it to Brian. He was my second, you know, taste right. tester there. He took a few puffs. He goes, I think you got something here. Right. Great made five samples from the rolling floor. So someone who actually knows what they're doing, like they actually rolled them, um, smoked it. And, you know, he says, great, let's put 5,000 of them in production. And, and at that point, Sebastian raises the question and I love him for this. He goes, well, what happens if they don't sell? And I just looked at him like, well, who cares? I'll give them out. Like, I love the cigar. I love the <laughs> you'll you'll like, get your check, right? <laughs> edge. Like it's 5,000 cigars. Like I have friends, family events, right. like we're, we can do something with it. Um, yeah. essentially that came in and vanished within super, super quickly. Um, so then I got myself into, you know, a bind essentially, or like, all right, cool. Well, I should make more Then, rather than me being smart. Um, I asked my retailers what they would like to see. So they said, well, make a Toro, obviously, uh, one of the three best selling sizes in the States. And then they pushed me to make a six by 60. Now I don't smoke enough six by sixties. It's just not, not my ring gauge. Right. Um, so I made a box press. Luckily, the Cavalier FTC factory is is absolutely incredible when it comes to box presses. Mm -hmm. And really, I just love it, right? Like I lean into their strengths yeah. and rather than say, hey, just ratio it out, right? This was uh, when I launched it, it was like July. Uh, yeah, it was like we had TP and then PCA like July-ish. Yep. So essentially, I went back to the drawing board and said, well, I'm not just going to tell them ratio it out. Um, I'm going to actually blend it to size. And that's why the six by sixty has an extra half leaf of Funder and Broadleaf mm -hmm. that really amplifies that right. whole like raisin, 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 like raisin plums, um, this beautiful uh, bourbon mash cereal grain like sweetness, right? And it goes back to the flavor intensity and just clarity, precision on a scale of one to five is an easy five, but body and strength, it's barely a two. So it's just purity of flavor. Um, it, yeah. It's so he, I got a question. Maybe you, I, I think you're going to be able to answer this. So I find some of the Mexican San Andreas could be a very pungent wrapper and it just sometimes will overpower a blend. This, this is not doing, this doesn't do it at all. This is what's really impressed me about it. What, what is the reason why that's not happening with this cigar? Um, I think <laughs> when you, when you look at that cigar and you see that right. there's San Andreas for the wrapper and San Andreas in the filler, right? You think that you're really going to get that pungent, yeah. earthy, yes. Dust. Like yes, gritty, and um, I just looked at it as, as a dish. It's counterbalanced by the viso jalapa, which gives you a ton of that sweetness. That milk chocolate that kind of sh shines through. And out of the four sizes, right? So the the three regular production sizes are the robusto, toro, six by sixty. I personally think the six by sixty actually just performs the best out of the three. Uh, also, it's a, a tweak blend. Right. Second one I would highlight is the Corona Gorda that you enjoy, and I made yeah. that for myself. Like that is a completely 
like yes. selfish, not like anything market driven. I made it for myself and no one else. Um, cause I personally love that, love that size. That's right. That's, it's really a great like size. Me. Yeah. It's a great size. I, and I actually think that San Andreas is a lot more of an influence in that particular size than it does in say that six by 60. Um, right. Just from the ratio perspective, mm -hmm. but you're right. The, the pungent, it, it was blended around it. It yeah. wasn't, it's, it doesn't highlight the blend doesn't highlight San Andreas or Visa a lot, but it highlights no. the owner of Broadleaf. No, it, it it's, uh, which is very interesting. Cause like I said, I, um, I'm getting like, this is, it's, like I said, you, there's not a lot of body on this side, but the flavors are all there. I mean, it's that's that's the one thing. It's 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 that true definition where I'd say full flavored, right? Because, uh, but it's not very heavy on your palate at all. Yeah, I'm. I I think that, um, right. I'm sure uh, more experienced blenders can really impart more of their signature and their their position right. on this. But to me, strength especially is a byproduct, right? No yeah. different than like alcohol and wine. Right. Like, yeah, it's got to be there. And it obviously imparts something both from a, from slightly impacting your right. body perception of body. Right. And then actually the, the, the effect on the body itself, like, I mean, your physical body, not perception of, of the cigar, yeah. but um, it's never about that in the blend. It's all about the flavor and the complexity. And I'm really trying to get as much flavor and as much complexity as I can without it being the body and the strength are almost a byproduct of that. And all three blends, I, I think the regular production blends are like, yeah. Yep. No, I, like I said, this was, uh, it was very different than any San Andreas I've had. Uh, it's also very different than anything I've had out of that factory as well. So it was, I love uh, that you mentioned that actually I've had multiple people say that be like, it tastes nothing like anything out of that factory. And I'm like, well, it's not supposed to like right, right. has a, has his own signature. Yeah. And, and you know, the, I love, I personally love the brand. They're good friends. Yeah. Um, but this is my signature. This is my take on Honduran yeah. Broadway. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the byproduct is they're putting it into, into an actual physical form, but that's completely my, right. my interpretation of it. Right. So the Corona Gordo though is a, it was a short run. That's just a it was limited a limited run. production run. Right. Um, and I'm and I'm and I'm doing this very strategically in terms of like long term right. planning. So uh, next year I'm going to add a limited production size in the Rioja blend. It's going to be a Lancero. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if there's if there is enough demand, I will put it as a regular production. But I kind of enjoy it. Um, I've also kind of released it in a funny way so uh one of the first times when you really go into the vineyard in in the first start of the year is is on valentine's day right and um i released it at on valentine's day and i only made 2600 of those because my birthday is on the 26th of february so i kind of combined those two made 2600 made in packs of 10 and you know they came and went essentially in that whatever 10 day 12 day period that it was available for sale um, I did do the right thing this time, and I saved about 15 packs for events that I'm going to either give out or I'm going to smoke them uh, rather than, you know, get into a situation where I have to buy them at full retail from one of my retailers and be happy about it. Too. Right, so, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, uh, but yeah. 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 Now, you also you also now have the companion blend uh, to BDX, the BDX Block, which is yes. a completely different blend now. That's completely a Connecticut. Completely different blend. And yeah. and I love the fact that, um, especially because you highlighted that it really is about the full flavor side of it. Yeah. This is, a, I think, an even better study in that because okay. this is an easy 4.5 or 5 on a scale of 1 to 5 in, in terms of like how full the, bl the, the flavor is. Mm -hmm. But there's no strength. This is just 1.5, maybe 2 if I'm being generous. Right. Just purity of flavor. Um, and, and I personally enjoy that because I... Uh, as all of us, right? Like we, we enjoy multiple yeah. cigars a day. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to, I made it in two sizes initially. So, well, there's a third one, which will be an event only one. So I'm going to give you and your listeners a little preview. Okay. Um, probably in around summertime, because I'm a big believer that people are creatures of habit. Um, I'm going to release it around last year's PCA dates mm -hmm. and it'll be very, very small, very small run. Um, I was, not stuck. I was I was in a crossroads. Do I want to put um, a little bit more Piloto Cubano in the blend or do I want to leave it with a quarter, quarter leaf in there? Right. And where I wanted to go ultimately with this blend, because it's a very targeted blend and I knew where I was going with this. Right. 
I ultimately opted for that and that became the regular production. However, the tweaked blend is really, really good. So I just made it in a six by 52 pyramid again, because I, I can trust that factor and it's box pressed and it's absolutely delicious. Right. Um, so I made a small short run for myself essentially. And people, people who come out to see me in person and, and have, you know, for people in stores that are going to come and visit and do one of our great events. Um, that's a tweaked blend, but this really is a, it, it really is a study in, in just purity of flavor. Uh, Ecuadorian Connecticut on the outside, Ecuadorian Habano. And then inside you have uh, Esteli, Hamastran, uh, Jalapa, and Piloto Cubano. So four different filler mm -hmm. tobaccos. Uh, comes in two sizes, the five and a half by 52 Robusto, and then a six and a half by 54 Toro. And I, I know that, right, my question with larger sizes is always, uh, and, and I think I spoke with Charlie, I believe, about this kind of the same way and be like, hey, in the time frame that it's going to take me to enjoy this larger size, would I be better off enjoying two di two different smaller right. cigars? Right. So um, I've smoked eight of these when, I, when I've had that final blend. I made 10 of them and basically uh, – Brian, again, right? We were we were yep. we were together at that time, so he smoked two of those, and I smoked the other eight. Um, the only reason why I didn't, and I and the same day, right? Like I basically spent the whole day just smoking this, trying to see if I'm going to get bored of the blend, and I didn't. Not, and at no point was I like, "This is boring. This is just outstaying. It's welcome." Um, which again is probably like, if I, if, by the way, if there is a person out there that ends up smoking eight of these a day, please let me know. I'll send you an extra 10 for just <laughs> being a weirdo, just like me. Um, but really this was, this was something, um, the only reason why I gave up after eight was a, I had no more cigars and B, we just lost eight domino games in a row against right. the, the Cuban fodder and sun combo. So, you know, yeah, <laughs> that kind of took, took, took the, uh, took the pleasant taste out of it. <laughs> No, I know Brian. Uh, I know the shop he smokes at in Miami, and he's uh, like always in training with dominoes down there. <laughs> like eleven thirty at night, these guys start playing dominoes in that store. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and Honduras is magical. I always have such a great time when uh, when I visit, and um, I budgeted a little bit longer than than what I essentially expected this blend to take. I uh -huh. budgeted a whole week. Literally nailed it. Like hour four, day two. Um, mostly because day one we were it took us like six hours to get from Tegucigalpa. So um I had a very clear vision. Like I know that the tobaccos I'm gonna use, it only came down to what are the sizes going to be, and then ultimately it was is it gonna be a quarter off or a full leaf? Right. So very, very clear. Um came to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Where we heard that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh was uh, there the name, yeah. the, the name references it right? Like Bordeaux Blanc, so white Bordeaux is a right. is a Sauvignon oh, Blanc Viognier blend uh, out of Bordeaux, right? And there are uh, uh, right outside of Old World, which is Europe. There are other side of uh, other takes on that blend, and essentially uh, this has a ton of roasted nuts, so almonds, almonds, walnuts, uh, pistachios, peanuts, everything but the kitchen sink. It's super creamy. It's delicious. And it really, really corresponds to what it is that those those uh wa those wines typically don't go past 13, 8, 14 percent alcohol. So they don't right. end up being super full. Right. Um, but super flavorful. So that's kind of exactly yeah. what it, you know, kind of fit the bill. Right. So when you when you build the original BDX, uh, that was the Honduran Broadleaf was kind of what you were building around. Was there a tobacco you were building around with the Blanc? Um, no. Oh, uh, well, okay. yeah, actually. Um, it, it was supposed to shine, uh, shine a light on the Ecuadorian Connecticut. Sure. Yeah. Right? Okay. Everybody yep. loves to say, not your grandfather's Connecticut. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Like I don't, I don't subscribe to that. I just, I personally love Connecticut and, um, I love that sweetness, that underlying sweetness, the, yep. the tons of creaminess that you typically get yeah. vanilla, cedar, oak, uh, uh, creaminess, the roasted nuts, almonds, walnuts, pistachios, right? Like all of that. And there's this, the super, super, super barely perceptible touch of spice on the back end to keep it interesting so it was kind of meant yeah. as a everyday smoke so yeah ecuadorian connecticut that's what's really supposed to be highlighted here um and i and i think i like it let me put it that way rather than say i think yeah. i did a good job like no i i, I right. like it yeah no again it was a, a one i would say that was 
again, something, another expression out of that factory that I hadn't had before. I've had, you know, um, I don't know if they do a lot of, I think they do a couple of Connecticut's now, but um, um, I know the, I, I know thought the, the gold, White Series was a Connecticut. It's a Habano, I believe. Oh, I, I, so Aaron, much is, I know. is it Habano or Connecticut, Aaron? I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. Please, it's a light wrapper. It's, it's a Claro wrapper. You know, and, yeah. yeah, you're right about that. You might you might be right. Actually, yeah, I think it is a Claro Habano. You're, I think you're right on that. I personally love that blend. I, that's one of my go tos. Yep. Um, especially in that, uh, it's not a fat robusto, but it's like four point eight by like fifty two. Yeah. Um, or something close to it. So I, I really personally love that. And then yep. um, for the packaging, actually, I did it. Here, I guess. So I did it as a little five pack and the idea is um, to correspond to a wine label. So if you yep. actually get one of these, like you can, it literally gives you all the information there, flavor, yep. body, the, the blend breakdown, and then it kind of corresponds to a wine label. And the yeah. one thing that I'm struggling and I would love to, you know, like I said, if anybody does come up with an idea, please let me know. I'll, I'll send you guys something nice. Um, I kind of want to find a way to either recycle or use these labels for something in a nice way. Um, yeah. the, the one thing that we have going on now, and I, I am collecting them, I have about eight or 10 of them just because I've been smoking a lot of those. Yep. Um, cause they're, you know, one per five pack, uh, where I'm going to make it for a shop, basically essentially make a, a beautiful little art piece. Yeah. Um, have been reinterpreted by one of my artist friends. Nice. I, I... So the white series is Habana. So, well, yeah, I thought it was Habano. I, Cause I actually thought it was Connecticut and I think Sebastian was the one who corrected me on it. That's why. Cause it's a very, very light wrapper. You look at that wrapper. Yeah, does he look doesn't like really know anything about that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. The profile wise, yeah. you're you guys are right. I'm I'm glad you checked it, Aaron. Yeah, you know I, I think still the, love the blend. <laughs> yeah, I think the Trace de, La, de La Quantes is the one that has the um the Connecticut. Yeah, they have the three different. They have yeah, the right. they have the three different, three yeah. different. Yeah, uh, yeah, they have the three with those. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and right. one more thing. So you you guys will um in the next ship, and you'll see updated bands. Um. So we went through the initial run of however many were there, and uh, the new set of bands is going to correspond to how the Rioja, the blue bands feel, uh, with mm. you know the raised, uh, the raised lettering, the embossing, basically everything that can be done. To this label has been done to it, and uh, something that I'm trying to do, and I think you guys saw it at the show. Um, we are rolling out <laughs> that virtual SOM experience. Yep, uh, where each of the boxes will have a little QR code. You scan it, and then my mug jumps out and be like, "Hey, let me tell you a little bit." Right, right. Um, I saw that. Uh, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about the the blend. And it's thirty seconds, right? Super, super short. Just gives you a little, you know. Thank you for for at least taking a look at it. Yeah, um, I did have a couple of people make the joke in there because I'm I. So this was filmed like January eighth. Um, it was still cold in Vegas. So it was probably like low forties. Um, so I'm in a I'm in a cashmere like sweater slash turtle turtleneck. Mm -hmm. And I've had like three or four people go, man, you look like you're about to steal the moon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, really? And then, you know, <laughs> someone else chimed in and they go, yeah, you're just a hairless cat with a, with a diamond <laughs> necklace away from, from being, you know, cursing James Bond and you're there. Right. <laughs> Making me rethink that a little bit, but yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. So we yeah, we haven't so we haven't talked yet about the uh, Rioja. Um hmm. this is a very uh so this is one you're making with with uh Eladio. With Eladio Diaz, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um very, very happy. So we're we're one of the few brands that come out of the Eladio or Diaz Cabrera factory. Um very, very happy, very lucky that uh and very happy with the with the partnership. Um they've been nothing but great partners. Uh we nailed the blend pretty quickly. I think it was like day two. Cause again, I, I kind of came in, had an idea of what I want to do, how I, how, what I want in there. And I, and that I knew was going to highlight two things. So one that I can't really disclose cause they asked me not to. Right. It's in the, and the other one is, um, Corojo. Corojo is such a polarizing, beautiful, lovely right. tobacco. Um, but people either love it or hate it. So kind of like the San Andreas have blended around it and, you know, one of those, one of my favorite compliments was I typically hate Corojo, but I actually like this cigar. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, great, like <laughs> this is, I'll take it. 
Um, comes in two sizes, uh, a five by 54 Robusto and then a six by 52 Toro. Yep. yep. Um, the Robusto is, huh? Um, I'm going to highlight the Robusto just because I really, really like it. Yep. Um, uh, it was just before TP, uh, that, that week, cause it launched at TP officially yep. about, uh, 10, 10 shops, I believe 10 or 12 shops. Um, got it as a little pre-release and then they were geographically separated. So everybody had a, a, you know, a little bit of, um, a fun experience, basically having a little sneak peek for their, for them and their, their, their customers and, and, and guests. Um, we did, uh, just before that TP, right. As everybody knows, like, oh, the logistics are always a problem. Like how is everything, who's booking the, all the stuff that comes with the show, right? I right. don't have any more hair to lose. So <laughs> it, it what it was. Um, but I was probably on my third cigar of the day. Uh, of that real come quality assurance right right um but i was smoking it and i really really got in fact that was on this very same patio and i kind of got annoyed and and i'm like i need to take a step back lean back and and then realize that the last two cigars the two and a half cigars actually at that point i've effectively just smoked without paying attention and it was such a fantastic companion then when i took that step back took a deep breath and like actually took a puff of that and paid attention to it. I was like, holy crap, like this is amazing. Um, so I, I'm going to highlight that Robusto uh, size just because that's like phenomenal. Uh, and I think it's, it, it highlights those two blends. It's the same exact blend. Um, Parojo on the outside, Mexican Sumatra binder, and then um, four different Dominican fillers. And I'll, I'll highlight th- or, I'll just close three of them. So it's okay. Thera 98, Thera 99, uh, Havana 2020. And then okay. the fourth one, I won't because it's they've asked me not to. Okay. But it's a very, very special, very rare, uh, very rare tobacco. Right. Uh, everything's uh, four to five years old, depending on, with, or three to three to five for the for the tobaccos across the board. Um, everything was rolled last March. The second, the second run was rolled in... Uh, mid September, early October was then it was actually finished. So the next uh, shipment is arriving probably next week or the week after. So I have a very strategic like this is rolled, then it sits for six months, then it gets released, and you can find in all the BDX boxes. Actually, if you look at the bottom, um, you can find when it says boxed on or rolled on particular month, and then you see it. Every I did notice that. Out. I did notice that. Yep. I, I'm a big believer in transparency, so yep. I'm like, look, there's. You actually are very transparent with your blends. Um, in a year at the trade show, a lot of people were going the opposite way. By the way, a lot of people weren't disclosing wrapper binder filler much this year. It seemed like mm-hmm. more than ever. It was interesting, and, I, and this was very like refreshing to see this. Again, I can I can tell them what the ingredients are, and and I'm sure if there's there's blenders out there, could probably dissect it and guess. Sure. What it yeah. Is. And, and if they can, more power to them. I mean, right. that just takes. And again, if they, it, I'm not, I didn't make a new type of tobacco. I, I picked existing ingredients right. and put them together in a, right. in a new way, yeah. right? No different than a chef making a different dish. There's right. a hundred million variations in a tiramisu, but maybe my tiramisu tastes better than someone else's interpretation or vice versa. Right. Sure. Or using really a different, is. different, you know, different, uh, percent. I use a different coffee for all I know. Right. Like, yeah, right. A little, a little bit more cacao, right. You know, really, uh, yeah. uh, comes down to, comes down to interpretation ultimately. Yep. Uh, the Honduran broadleaf, I think, I think there's only three cigars that on the market that use it or disclose it. Let me put it this way that I know of. Um, I think that, or I tried to highlight it the most now, right. whether that was the right move, I don't know because, I imagine it five years from now when when there's more blends with that, I'm sure, you know, if we go back, say, a decade ago or 15 years ago, um, the interpretations of the first interpretations of Connecticut Broadleaf versus what Connecticut Broadleaf is is available and how many different variations in the market from a blend perspective, it is it's night and day. Yep. And, you know, uh, Tatuaki's interpretation of, say, Connecticut Broadleaf versus someone else's is they're going to vary. And, and yeah, the um, so Rioja, that's a uh, that's obviously the region of Spain for wine. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't touch on the on the name. No, that's okay. um, so uh, Rioja is is a famous Spanish wine region. Um, yeah. 
primarily known for Tempranillo and it's and it's three different bottling mm -hmm. uh, bottling levels. So right. Crianza being, uh, and I'm talking about the reds, right? So Crianza being uh, the entry level one, uh, Reserva being the second, and then Gran Reserva being the highest tier. And if you look, if you if you Google Gran Reserva Rioja, you'll see that it kind of references that label right. where it's blue and and silver. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really, this is an interpretation of Dominican terroir with um, referencing the the Spanish region for one simple for one simple reason. When I finally like said, okay, like yes, this is the blend. Um, I was sitting on my patio enjoying a, a phenomenal phenomenal bottle of uh, Rioja with my girlfriend, and I was like, man, this is such a good pairing. And I was like, yeah, this sounds this sounds like the name. So Rioja stuck. <laughs> Right. No, that's cool. So, you know, uh, this is something I'm just observing. You can tell me if I'm onto something or not tell me if, if I at all. But so you're using uh, FTC for the Bordeaux, mm -hmm. using uh, Eladio's factory for the Rioja. Is that kind of mm -hmm. deliberate that you're kind of just tying yes. the factory with the wine? And was there anything yes. to that? Why Why it was that way? Um. So uh, it, it also kind of, <laughs> right, Bordeaux is a blend essentially in, in its shortest most narrowest definition right. would be cab merlot um yeah. and its widest would be all the, all the other varietals so um essentially especially if you look at the white bordeaux um even though it's only two varieties right it'd be sauvignon blanc and viognier um it essentially has five different tobaccos that are in there so i kind of reference that and i also wanted to keep it unified so if i do end up making another blend out of out of uh, Eladio, it'll probably be named after a Spanish wine region because I want to kind of give right. them, um, you know, very different, very simple differentiation yep. of what we're doing. Right. Um, one of the people kind of raised this as an issue, and, and I want to, <laughs> I want to address it. They were like, "Well, you're using the same rings on the BDX. Like, how can people differentiate it?" Right. And I just stood there for a second and said, "Well, one's a San Andreas Maduro, and the other's a Connecticut." <laughs> <laughs> like pretty like pretty apparent difference yeah yeah know? yeah yeah not that i see color or anything but like this is pretty apparent guys right. like come on right um but yeah that was kind of the idea and then uh rioja is also typically right like essentially it's going to be 100 percent tempranillo mm -hmm. um so with it being almost entirely uh entirely dominican it's almost a, a dominican puro aside right. from the dominican sumatra hence the reference Sure, make make some sense. Um, and like I said, these, these these is also a regular production line. All these are regular mm -hmm. production lines. Absolutely. Both, with some uh, of the limited, with some of the limited, so, like the Lancero. You said something that's yeah. Uh, the Lancero will come out uh, next year, probably for my birthday again. So probably right. le released on the fourteenth. Like available for shop store until the twenty sixth. Right. Then it's closed. Um, it'll be a Lancero. Um, again, ten count, same as everything else. Uh, I'm a big believer in, you know, all those boxes are 10 counts except for, for the, for the BDX, which is a five count and kind of, right. kind of a nice little pack that you can just grab and go. And, and now I'm kind of kicking myself for not making them 10 counts just because I've, I've, I'm going through these quite a bit. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, you know, at the trade show, I got to mention that this is like one of my favorite, uh, gadgets I took home is this lighter that you gave me the, uh, soft flame. Of course, I. I yeah, it's not showing, but yeah, it is going. I, I I love it. So that was um again, you guys probably can't see because I'm follically challenged here, but it is quite windy. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if but it, it does. It, yeah, right. Like you can see that it's windy. Yeah. It was yeah. uh, when we first jump on jumped on. It was uh, probably 35, 40 miles an hour. Now it died down a little bit, but after last year's PCA. Um, and you guys who were in Vegas remember, right? There was a massive heat wave, and I think it topped out at 117. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, like it was it, it was rough. Um, so on this sa Sunday, um, I think after the show, like the week, right? Because the show ended up like Tuesday. And then basically that Sunday, we were still like putting up all the orders, making sure everything's going out, blah, blah, blah. So that's, you know, kind of a pinnacle after like 30 days of pulling 15, 20 hour days. Um, essentially I sat on the patio. My girlfriend went to visit her, her sister. And I was like, you know what? I painted this beautiful picture of how I'm going to enjoy it. Put my laptop out, played some music, 
set myself outside. I'm going to light this beautiful cigar up. Sure enough, gust of wind comes out. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to play around with this soft flame. So one, two, three times, no dice. Right. <laughs> so I get into the corner back there and I'm like, look like I'm about to smoke some rocks. Um, <laughs> and it's not going anywhere. So now I'm frustrated, right? Like my, my, my day turned from this beautiful picture that I painted. Now it's fanned by a little bit of frustration and laziness. I'm a big believer that really you're, you know, the best inventions kind of come from that laziness. Yeah. Uh, so I go, okay, I have to go inside the house. I have to get a torch. Um, I was just comfortable. I plopped myself in this, this beautiful chair. All right. So I go in there, come back and I'm like, I'm a little pissed. Like my, my day isn't ruined, but it's been upset. Mm -hmm. I go, this is annoying. So I, anyway, I, I light it up. I can't really keep a torch because again, it's 117 outside. I don't want to leave it on my, on my fire pit here and raise my insurance rates. Um, and rather than sit back, kick back and like, enjoy the cigar, enjoy the, the music. I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. Like I'm pissed. So I go online and I find a, a couple of these lighters that are available between, you know, 75 to like two grand. Yep. And I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. So now annoyed on this Sunday after putting in, you know, 30 plus days of a ton of hours, I'm like, I'm annoyed. I reach out to probably, I want to say like five, five or seven factories. And I reached out to them and asked them basically said, Hey, these are the, these are the parameters. I don't know if you make this, can you make it like design it basically? Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, well you need a, a certain, uh, like one of the factories actually came back. Like we can, we can have a sample for you in the next, I forget what it was, it was like three or four weeks. We'll send it to you. The minimum order is this. Like if you commit to that, essentially more or less blind, I said, you know, I'm I'm not really going to do that. But if you send me a sample, like I'll put a deposit down, and you know, yeah. if it if it doesn't work, like you guys can just keep it. So late um, August, I want to say, I got my first sample in a in a blue color to correspond to the Rioja. Um, absolutely loved it. Put them into production, and uh, I think the first shipment arrived around November, like early November. And between November and now. Um, I've added multiple color schemes. The idea was for all of them to kind of correspond to the to the blends. Right. So blue for Rioja, um, the red that is coming in in Burgundy, right, is going to correspond to, to the BDX. The gold is supposed to correspond to the Connecticut, and the black one was a complete mistake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, people actually really liked them. Uh, the uh, factory ended up making uh, making them in black. Uh, instead of blue and the first run i think it was like 100 lighters that were just in black and you know i was like hey this is a limited edition run uh yeah. people like them and love and and i was just like all right this is i guess this solves the next color of the band uh when, when i had the fourth regular the product. black yeah <laughs> yeah that that kind of solved it uh but yeah. the funny part is these were never meant to be for sale um these were just meant to be as giveaways as you know my little solution to, to frustration of mine and uh a couple of shops reached out and were kind of like hey like what is you know what's the msrp on these and i ran this very very complex like mckinsey level pricing strategy um that kind of i kicked back lit up a cigar and said all right if i was a customer in a cigar shop and i spent a hundred bucks on this I spent 75 bucks, 50 bucks, 30 bucks, 25 bucks. Like how pissed would I be if I lose it? Cause I've, I've lost, I'm sure you be between the yeah. three of us. I'm sure. We've yeah. lost a hundred lighters. Right. Um, and I ultimately said, you know what, I'm going to sell it a little bit above cost and like, just use this as a marketing exercise. And I'm just going to say, Hey, MSRP is 25 bucks. That way, if I lose it in a gym bag or lose it at the golf course or drop it at the cigar lounge, or it doesn't work like, I'm not really upset. It works. That's it. Like it's, it's easily replaceable. It over delivers for the money. And you know, that was kind of it. Um, cause again, I'm, I'm not in the accessory business. This is, this is just a little nice, nice. Right, little right. Um, and you know, knock on wood at this point, uh, I just got a shipment in, um, last Monday. Uh, I've got, no, actually this Monday, um, we are, I think we moved through over 2000 of them between the three, uh, colors. 
So mm -hmm. there's 2000 people that are using these lighters and I want to thank each and every one of them. Uh, I did have a beautiful question. Someone did ask like if the flint's uh, changeable. So I did actually, um, the, the flint is changeable. And I, I'm just going to say this if, you know, two years from now, your flint actually dies and you need to replace it. Um, two things, either buy a new one or uh, reach out to me and I'll replace it for free. Because if you've <laughs> used it and cherished it for two years, the least I yeah. can do is provide you at least another two years worth of enjoyment. So, um, and we have it now in video. So you guys can call call me out 10 years from now when we're you <laughs> right, know, right, right. There's <laughs> 2 million of them out there. Right. Maybe I can. Maybe the factory can burn down for insurance money. You know, <laughs> at that point. Oh uh, no! Be careful what you sign up for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, but no, you. So no, that like I said, it's a fun lighter. Uh, I enjoy. I enjoy using it. Uh, I was. I. I was debating trying to put it in my carry on bag, and I said, mm, I'm not gonna take a chance. I. Uh, so I just. I did put it in the, my. Uh, my check bag, and I it made it back. Okay, so. I'm I'm glad. I there was a, I believe it was Zycar that used to sell those. There's this like uh, TSA approved yellowish egg looking thing. We have one, yeah. Yeah, I, and that this was, I probably got one, not 15, but like 10 plus years ago for sure. Uh, and I've used it. I've used it to. I've actually transported my SD Duponts because I'm always like super super yeah, uh, super iffy that that doesn't you know grow legs. Um, so I've used that, but I, I haven't seen that. It's probably out of production. So that, yeah, that's I haven't seen them for a while. I remember those when they were popular. Yeah. Now, now they have these like ones that you could take, like, it looks like a big lighter and you put it in and it's a torch. It, it becomes a oh. torch. Cool. If there's any TSA agents looking at this, don't, <laughs> don't start grabbing Bix. No, I know. Um, no, no, they, they don't. Uh, no, Bic is like the only, the only time they've confiscated a Bic from me is in, uh, Nicaragua. They've compensated my back. <laughs> uh, so. I remember uh, 2021, uh, we're sitting at uh, Palazzo. It's not the, it's the one with the library that, that just changed. And I live in town and I can't remember it because I just. I uh, the Casbar? Yeah. Uh, no, it's in, it's in, Pal uh, it's in Palazzo, not the Venetian. Oh, I th yeah. It was closed last year. I thought. But yeah, they closed it. Um whatever we were I sitting there yeah i remember i can't remember the name and of it there's there's nine of us sitting in this right with booth with two sides um there were three cigar factory owners slash yep. manufacturers three brand owners two distributors and one extra person on the side and none of us had a lighter and I'm like, yeah, this is about as as close as you can get yeah. for, for for the cigar industry, right? Like in Vegas, like that's exactly what happens. And then someone produced a bic, and I'm like, great, this is this is gonna work. So nine of us were all lighting cigars with, with a bic, with a bic, like, oh, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, you go down to Nicaragua, that's always the case too. The like Dorsey. Everyone... What was that? Dorsey. Was that the name yeah. of the bar? Dorsey. The Dorsey was. Dorsey. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Dorsey. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That was yeah. It yeah. was weird this year uh, to see, to to sit at the circle bar at the Venetian and, you know, not have the whole cigar crew there. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the crystals in Resorts World and then eight were, were the yeah prime spots crystal, this, this crystal, time around. Yeah, I heard crystal was pretty crowded, um, uh, but I thought it was pretty big too. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah, we were off site, so. Yeah, because the circle bar at, at the Venetian has two, four... Uh, you know, top maybe about twelve tables, if that. Probably closer yeah. to ten. Um, Crystals has probably double that, if not more. Yeah, um, and it's obviously a lot bigger space. Um, but there's a there's a nostalgia piece with you know everybody being cramped up on top of one another. Yeah. That, that bar is essentially made for sixty people, but you have hundred thirty seven people smoking cigars. <laughs> Um, that's always funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, but yeah, no one in the industry has a lighter. It's that's kind of the joke. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you go down to Puro Sabor, it's the same thing. Like <laughs> it's Bix. <laughs> I said if someone just started a lighter like uh, loaner business down there, they do really well. Yeah. Uh, was... Yeah. <laughs> uh, whenever I whenever I travel down to Honduras, I try to uh, I use I bring one of one torch with that little egg every time, and I just leave it there, and that's that's the. That's my entry visa into Honduras. 
<laughs> right, right. <laughs> I actually had a very funny experience the first time I went there. Uh, so at the time I had my green card and I still had my Serbian passport. I still do a, a dual citizenship, but essentially I called every single Honduran embassy mission, whatever I could find. Right. And I just, you know, I couldn't get in touch with anybody. So I ended up calling the, uh, Honduran mission to the UN <laughs> and I called them and I started right off the bat. Uh, this lady picked up and I go, ma'am, I, I know you're not the right person, but I've been trying to get with touch with someone for two weeks. I'm getting conflicting information. I just want to make sure I can actually be admitted to the country. So she's like, sure, here's the contact for the consulate. And I want to see DC, right? And the one for Miami, like here's the direct line, like forget about the website because they said I can travel into Honduras with a green card. I don't need a visa, but then if you look at it somewhere, it's a, I do need a visa back and forth. So I check with them. They said, Hey, you're completely fine. So I land in Miami. Um, by the way, uh, for anybody who is based in Miami, I hate Miami airport almost as much as LAX. I want to get that out of the way. <laughs> um, and the American, uh, American airlines basically says, you know, we can't let you board. You can't enter because you don't have the right paperwork. And after going back and forth for a little bit, I essentially said, why do you guys care if they won't let me in? My only other option to get out of the country is American Airlines. So why not have you guys make double the money? And the supervisor looks at me and be like, hey, this great one. Yeah. <laughs> let him. Um, so right. I land in Honduras. Uh, Brian, again, we were on the same flight. So Brian just passes through. They wave him. And then they get to me. Right. <laughs> Guy looks at it. This country doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't. I go, sir, it exists. And my my Spanish is utilitarian enough. And I'm like, right. you know, it exists. Back and forth. Second guy comes out. Third guy comes around. Fourth guy comes around. Everybody's looking at it. I gave him my green card. Gave him everything. Brought him a pay piece of paper, right? Like, everything's fine. <sighs> Supervisor finally gets involved. They Google it. The country does exist. He stamps it. Brian goes, I thought they weren't going to let you in. <laughs> and I go, look, I think this might be the first situation they've ever encountered. The Serbian guy with American, uh, right, like with a green card traveling to Honduras without a visa. This is like legitimately the first time they've ever seen it. Yeah. Right, right. And everybody just started laughing and that was just great. And then the second time I just showed up with, an, with my American passport. In the meantime, I got my citizenship. They just looked at it, whoop, in and out, 30 seconds. Um, very, very fun experience traveling to, to Honduras. I never heard of a the country not exists one. That, that's a, that's a new one. Mm. I actually had, so this is, this is a great, um, I was flying out of, uh, flying back from Costa Rica and this was still, I need a COVID test before being admitted to the States. So they do the COVID test and the lady goes, this country doesn't exist. And I go, what about Yugoslavia? So to give you an idea, Yugoslavia has not existed since early 2000s. <laughs> yeah. True enough. Lady finds Yugoslavia on their, on their, uh, on their actual list, gives me the paperwork and signs it in Spanish, right? Like not Yugoslavia, Serbia, right? Like, right, right. It. The border border guy now flying out of Co Costa Rica looks at it and he's like, what the hell? And I'm like, yeah, man, just, Let's not let's not do this again. <laughs> and he just yeah. started laughing. He's like, fine. And I'm like, look, I'm flying yeah. back on flying back to the States with everything. Like, this should be fine. Um, but that was funny. That that country legitimately does not exist for you know 20 years at this point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that was that was a fun little experience there. Yeah, yeah. It was uh that's true. It's like it's funny because my I was I don't know, we were having a conversation with my kids and they're in their twenties. And let's talk about Sarajevo, Yugoslavia Olympics. And they're like, what's Yugoslavia? I'm like, I can't exactly. Say. Yeah. Yeah. I said, don't they teach world history anymore in school? I'm like, come on. <laughs> so I've heard, I've heard one thing that is extremely uh, yeah. upset me to an extreme point. Uh, I, I, I was born in 1990. I heard w one probably like late teens, but the kid referred to it, uh, the 90s as the late 1900s. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that made me just a little bit upset. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you're not wrong, but yeah. also you're kind of not correct. Like, right. The late 1900s.
Right, right. <laughs> that was uh, slightly infuriating. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Uh, we were talking a little in the green room, Vlad, and you do have a couple of other things that, uh, you know, project-wise you're working on as well. Oh, yeah. There's a... So, um, during the summer, I'll, I'll release that uh, that event-only blend mm -hmm. for... Uh, on the uh the Connecticut the Connecticut version, which is a tweaked blend. There's only a thousand of them. So they're gonna be really limited and they're they are going to be limited uh, to in-person events. I we might find one vendor um that has an online presence that'll just make it available to their customers. But again, that's I'm not gonna there there's just not enough of them. And and I do want to reward people that come out and you know invest the time and we're gonna make some really, really fun yeah. events. Uh around that and then we also have a plan and uh, today's the fourth right so in about six weeks um to my knowledge this is a, <laughs> this is a world first and if someone knows differently like please let me know um i i'd like to transparency reasons i don't want to say something that's just not true right we are going to do an event with uh a partnership with boveda really um i want to test out the uh, love, how humidity affects your perception. Right. So we're going to have three different humidity levels of the same cigar. And um, this is kind of geared to more experienced smokers just because it is going to be a little um, a little more engaging, a little more daunting. We're going to take three cigars at those three different humidity levels and smoke them essentially side by side, take all the data points, and then we'll reveal which what? cigar was at, at, at what humidity. Um, I think it's a it's a great educational experience. It'll be on uh, May seventeenth at Humidor of Lyle in Lyle, Illinois. Right. So keep an eye out. We'll start promoting it, and we'll do some, and we'll do a number of these yeah. throughout the uh, throughout the country. The idea is to gather enough um, gather enough data. I, I do like numbers, and um, while data can be manipulated, data doesn't lie. Essentially, yeah. So I would like to. Uh, get these data points from about three to 500 people where we can legitimately say, this is how certain humidity affects the smoking experience in this very narrow case, right? So the same cigar, um, we're going to ensure that all of them are at the same humidity because Boveda is going to use um, from their, from their uh, lab, right? Their research lab, right. they are actually going to essentially guarantee that, that, uh, that it is at, at what it says it is because their their humidity control is uh yeah. I believe the variation is 0.1 or 0 0.1. So very, very, very small uh uh margin of error in terms of how precise it is. So it, yeah. it's going to be really interesting and I'm very, very excited about that. I've never done um I know from personal experience and preference like what I enjoy. But this is going to be very, very nice and, and very t uh, targeted. Uh, aside from that, I am bringing, and uh, the person who gave me the, the name knows this, and he is going to get the first uh, one of those. Um, I'm going to uh, add a cutter into our accessories, and that will be an event-only giveaway item. Um, it's going to be called the Pocket Vlad. Um, it's going to be a wine key and a cigar cutter. So, Oh, nice. Oh, cool. um, it's, it's something... It fits the brand, yeah, and yeah. it's a fun old take, and we're just gonna make a make a little joke out of it. So I think, yeah. uh, you know, I know where the first one is going. I should have him in a few weeks. Um, there was that was a fun old experience. So that's some interesting stuff. And then the like I mentioned, there's the virtual psalm that's uh, you can find in in the boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, something that I am doing with cigar lounges that offer uh, spirits, wine, or beer. Um, I am doing a number of different pairing suggestions, and my initial idea was to do them just across the board, like the little, hey, like this is what you should pair. Like these are the suggested pairings, and the more I dove into it, the more uh, I listened to, to to people asking me for, for specific, um, specific pairings to what they offer. Mm -hmm. And uh, since my background is hospitality and I've done enough consulting projects and ran, you know, big beverage programs, including, you know, grand award lists and, and things like that, I have enough knowledge that I can do something like that. And and the focus on all of these events is just to make it experience driven. It's not supposed to be all the events are not really sales driven. They're right. supposed to enrich the experience of people who have taken their time 
um, invested some of their money, which, and which I'm very grateful and respectful of. And then ultimately their time, which is the one resource we really can't get back. Um, yeah. I can, you know, if someone doesn't like the cigar, I, I have no problem giving them another one or even, you know, I used to tell people, Hey, if you don't like it, like I'll send you a check, but now we have Venmo. So I'll just mm -hmm. Venmo you back if you really don't like it. But, um, really in that situation, I can't give them back time. So I got to make sure that the events are going to be enriching, uh, and, and enriching, enriching experience really. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think these are great events, by the way. Um, they're just like, I like more experiential events. Uh, I think we're, we're, we used to have a lot of them years ago and they've kind of gone away. So I'm kind of liking this approach a lot. Um, I'm like, I'm really curious on that Bobito one. That, that, that Me sounds, too. I'm, it, I'm, yeah. I am I'm fully intend on, uh, yeah. we're, we're going to publish those, those, uh, the data points, right. We're going to share it with the industry and, and, you know, share it with everybody really. Yeah. Um, and I always go back to Mythbusters, right? Like what's the difference between, science and screwing around how they put it writing it down yeah and i'm like yeah that makes sense so if we just write it down and you know put it in a in a format that's presentable be like hey this is what you can expect this is how it changes in this particular situation and i fully fully recognize the the um challenges of, of that approach right we are essentially taking an imperfect tool which is our palette and we're funneling it through a subjective experience, which is our perception of it, right. which is colored in turn by what do we enjoy? What's our, what's our, uh, how rich and varied is our day-to-day -day di diet, our, our experience, uh, uh palate experience, rather, uh, our background, um, all kinds of different things. Like we, we can't really control them. I can't, uh, you know, if I could, ideally, I would like to clone five Aaron's and five Williams and five right. Vlad's and like put them, put all five of those in a room, uh, five of each and like, hey, let's run this 500 times. But that's yeah. unrealistic. So yeah. um, we're going to try and get the best data we can present it. And hopefully it'll be a nice little talking point in New Orleans. That's great. Cool. That's great. All right, uh, Aaron. Any other things for Vlad before we kind of get into some of these other things here? No, I think this week's on time. We should keep going, but uh, I definitely want to chat more with Vlad at uh, maybe New Orleans or something like that. Because uh, oh, yeah. I'm always, uh, you know, about the the whole flavor tasting things and all that kind of stuff, perception, yep. all that stuff. So it's just an yeah. interesting topic. It is a really interesting. Like I said, it, it is to me as well. Um, Aaron's taught me it's all about flavor. You're talking about all about flavor, so it, it's a very it's really refreshing to talk, have this type of conversation tonight too. Well, not to, not to invite myself back, but if your downloads don't completely tank and this doesn't get shut down, I would like to come back and we can just do one. That's not like brand specific. We can just dive into the whole, like, Hey, this is how you perceive things. We can, we can make it more engaging. And again, if people, uh, even if, if you want to adjust the format a little bit and bring people in or just ask questions while we're on the live, I, I'd love to, you know, make it like an open Q and A after a little, uh, little presentation. I'm happy to do that uh, again, provided I don't end up shutting this down thing down. <laughs> no, you won't. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'd love it. No, we appreciate um, that. Yeah, and then uh, I, I like to do something. I don't know if you guys uh, do any kinds of raffles, but um, I'll put together some nice little care packages for for your listeners, and um, I'll let you guys choose however you want to raffle yep. them off. I'll do five different packages. So just let me know whoever the unlucky people are. Um, they get to interact with me and I'll, I'll send yeah, them some that, We yeah, could do that. We cool. can make that. Yeah. We'll make that happen. So we'll talk about that for sure. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So I got a few questions here. Um, mm -hmm. This is, first of all, this is our FSG beef segment of the night and it's related to beef, the meat. So yes, my sir. first question before we go, are you a vegan or no? No. Okay. Okay. So here's the <laughs> question for you. You're, you're in Las Vegas. What's your best steakhouse in Las Vegas to go to? Mm, that's a oof, that's a tough question. Um, I'm gonna put it in three different segments. Uh, if you wanna impress people and and make it an experience, Peter Luger's is definitely one of those. Have you gone to one uh, in New York yet? Yes. Um, okay. I, I heard it's a little different in Vegas. It's not quite the same atmosphere, but the, but the food is very good. It's the food is is, yeah. is exceptional. Absolutely yeah. terrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've had I've dined there th three times I think yeah. um really really good um you know really phenomenal atmosphere service 
everything everything corresponds to the experience yep. um, you had in New York. And the first time I went to the original, the, the one in Brooklyn, rather, yep. um, next to Davidoff, Brooklyn, was uh, they still it was cash only. That was uh, 09 or 2010, something like that. So that was a great experience uh for me and i still remember it they don't um, even want to give you a menu there <laughs> no uh my mom uh the the german potatoes right like the the, the roasted potatoes oh uh, yeah my mom actually makes them just yeah. made them as, as we were kids growing up and yeah. i still make them whenever yeah. i'm bored it's, it's basically a quick little quick little snack um if you want something that doesn't break the bank but it's really really phenomenal there's cleaver or it's uh sister property or i guess the original one which is herbs and rye uh, okay. Both phenomenal steakhouses, phenomenal uh, cocktail programs, uh, fin fantastic wine list. Um, it doesn't break the bank because they have a, a happy hour, which is basically all the steaks are 50% off. Wow. Um, so you can end up less than 100, 100 bucks a head, honestly, with app appetizer, cocktail, steak, um, and a great experience. So that's that would be my second choice. And then SW. I'm, you know, the, I just love everything about the win. Um, I think it's one of the greatest. We went there. Spots in Vegas, yeah. Yeah, we were there uh, a couple of years ago, Aaron and I. Very, very, very we, good. We we didn't order the lobster though, Aaron and I. Yeah, that's but, or, but, the but someone, or the wagyu. Or the wagyu. Or the wagyu. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was a media Definitely. dinner, and someone went a little <laughs> overboard. <laughs> it wasn't us though. Um, I can I can kind of guess if it was a media dinner and someone was invited. I can kind of guess who it was. Uh, <laughs> Probably good. Yeah. Um and. By the way, if you are, in, uh, if you ever just walking around the wind, the Overlook Lounge or what, what is now called uh, Overlook Lounge, which is called Parasol Up, is absolutely fantastic. I love enjoying a cigar there. Um, plush, crust, plush, crushed velvet chairs. Yeah. Uh, like beautiful spot. And one of my favorite spots to enjoy a cigar on the strip, not counting, obviously, cigar bars. Right. 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 Of course. Yeah. All right. So, so well, this is a little bit of a fun segment here. Uh, it's a little bit of a, of a brain teaser. We call this the ties that bind. Uh, and this segment I want to mention is brought to you by um, our friends at Altidus USA. Elevate your humidor at Altidus USA Cigars. Explore top-rated crafts such as the A. Kelman Banker Day Trader, Trinidad Spirit 2 No. 1, Monte Cristo 1935 Edition Diamante, and Aging Room Quattro Nicaragua Sonata, all boasting a stellar 93 rating from Cigar Aficionado. Light up, relax, savor, and enjoy every puff of excellence. So, Vlad, I'm going to name three things. And basically, the idea with this, you guys just tell me what they all have in common. Sometimes these questions are ridiculously easy, and I think they're hard. In the opposite way, sometimes I think they're ridiculously hard and people get them. So uh, there's really no wrong answer, and I'll give you some hints along the way with right. these, uh, with them. All right. So uh, this is – here are the three things. The first one is a wheel. So it's a wheel like on a car or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it could be a, a Ferris wheel or something like that. The second one is the Earth, as in planet Earth. And the third thing is a tornado. What do all three of those things have in common? They all rotate. Yes, they all rotate. Oh. Yep, there you got go. Him. <laughs> the earth... I was gonna say the first thing that came to mind, twister. <laughs> yeah, I tried yeah. to. I tried to throw that one in because everything was round, and I figured everyone could. So I threw the tornado one in there to see if someone could. If yeah, I could, if I could do that. All right, no, you, like I said, I have to make these harder again, Aaron. They've been, I've been too light late with these the last couple of weeks, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to make these harder again. <laughs> like when I first started doing this, it were, I was like, no one was getting any of these, so then I made them a little easier. But now I'm gonna have to make them harder again. But okay, yeah. no, good job, good job. Yay! Oh, all right, so Vlad, I, I got to do a few more sponsor reads, and then I have a yeah, rapid course. fire thing, um, <laughs> and uh, that will wrap it up for you. So, uh, let me first mention uh, JRE Tobacco. The authentic Carajo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful tobacco leaves out there. During the golden age of Sousa Cuba, the leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars because it's one of the most challenging ones to cultivate. It fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamistron Valley in Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Carajo from the original seeds. And in 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Carajo back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Carajo. Now with Jerry Tobacco, who is and Husso brought their very own brand to market, and each contain the authentic Carajo leaf. Aladino is available in a wide variety of blends, including the latest release, the Aladino Sumatra, 
company to represent the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. The available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco or Legacy that is tasted in every draw. I want to mention Corona Cigar Company. At Corona Cigar Company, they take pride in the fact that they are cigar fanatics just like you. That's why you'll find the best selection of the rarest and finest premium cigars available anywhere in the world. Plus, they have special limited edition cigars available exclusively to Corona Cigar Company from famous international cigar makers such as Padron, Davidoff, um, and Aganor Salif. They have the best selection, best customer service, and money-saving discounts, cigar prices. But don't just take their word for it. Forbes magazine selected Corona Cigars, best of the web. Corona Cigar was voted a top five internet cigar retailer by Smoke Magazine. And Cigar Aficionado wrote, Corona Cigar Company, the largest, best stock cigar shops in America. You can place an order online at their website or visit one of Corona's five central Florida cigar superstores and cigar bars and see for yourself why. So Corona Cigar Company is the ultimate cigar experience. And I want to mention again our friends at Cavalier Cigars. Cavalier Cigars, Cavalier Cigars, Smoke Gold, Stay Gold. Join the inner circle and follow Cavalier Cigars on Instagram at Cavalier underscore Cigars and on Facebook at Cavalier Genev Cigars. That's Genev, G-N-E-V-E. Visit your local tobacconist and join the movement that is Cavalier Cigars. They're consistently regarded highly by cigar lovers everywhere as well as high ratings by the cigar industry press. You want to follow them on Instagram at Cavalier underscore Cigars because they do some very unique giveaways throughout the whole year. Cavalier Cigars, smoke gold and stay gold. And I uh, want to mention we're going to get into our Alec Bradley Live True segment sponsored by Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley. Visit alecbradley.com to find out more about their cigars. Live True. All right, Vlad, I got eight questions for you. Uh, seven of them are not cigar related. One is in here. So I try to um, do a couple that are unique to you. And there's a few that I, I do with guests from time to time. So here's the first question for you. Blood. what's a dream car that you want to drive that you haven't driven 1989 560 sl wow you you knew that one right away got that yeah. one locked and loaded and one in the chamber ready <laughs> uh, no absolutely so uh i i really fell in love with this um if you like movies so in the 1980s there was a, a fantastic movie it was a 360 sl actually in that one uh richard gear playing um, uh, an American gigolo. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Also brought uh, a fantastic designer to prominence, uh, Armani, right? With yes. the skinny ties and the full look. So yep. um, ever since then, I've, I've never gotten a chance. I've ridden in one, but I've never driven one uh, of the 560 SL. I can already picture it, right? Cream, cream uh, leather, cream leather interior with a red, with a red uh, paint outside, obviously, you know, uh, convertible version so yeah i got that one ready all right nice nice all right all right what's a television show or movie that you would watch over and over again uh hmm. uh all right for series uh comfort thing and you know this might be a millennial thing the office i've rewatched it a billion times and like know it off the top of my head um yeah, like no, it's it's my it's, two oldest kids are really into the office, and one is close to your age, and one's a little younger. But yeah, 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 yeah. it's it's just funny. It, that can never be made, like in this yeah. day and age. Like it just, it just can't be remade. It was it was a product of its of its time, and it's and yep. it stays like it holds up incredibly well. Yep. Um, as far as a movie, um, God, I don't want to say Godfather because such cliche or like Goodfellas. Um, I I do consider some of the best movies of the 20th century are Space Odyssey 2001. Um, I I absolutely adore it. Like incredible movie. I could rewatch. I've rewatched it like 15 times. And the fact that in the first 17 minutes of the movie, there's not a single line of dialogue, is is incredible. Um, aside from that, uh, Apocalypse Now. And oh, what a great movie fantastic movie and then one thing uh that i do want to do is just because right Sam is is the brand i want to get the there's a there's a scene with the huey uh huey gunner where he goes where he's shooting get some get some so i'm gonna make a little sticker that says get some s-o-m-m right <laughs> right right <laughs> and whoever gets it gets it right like if right. you don't it's just it is what it is so those right right be the uh yeah the those would probably be the two the the two movie movie choices all right nice nice all right you live in las vegas uh we all know about las vegas what's something about living in las vegas that people might not realize that maybe um, a surprise to people 
the outdoorsy, like the outdoors uh, in and around Las Vegas is incredible. Um, oh, yes. You could, ski, I mean, you can ski 45 minutes away from the strip. Uh, Valley of Fire is absolutely incredible. If you like hiking, there's a ton of hiking spots um, outside. Uh, it's fantastically beautiful and, and I admire um, every every day I take a drive out of my community and just it it's in Henderson so it's the south like west side of, of Vegas mm -hmm. um, there's this beautiful overlook where you see the red rocks you see the mountains in the distance you see the strip and every time I look at it it either looks fake um, just incredible between the colors the the, the beauty of it is, is incredible um, also from a Right now we're taking a little bigger, like bird's eye view of the of the city. This city could not exist in any other country in the world, and I'm incredibly grateful that I live here. Um, perhaps maybe somewhere in the Middle East, just because of right how much money's located there. But really, yep. this city could not exist anywhere else in the world. And the fact that it more people visited than Paris, over forty million people visit Vegas a year, um, is incredible. It's uh, you know, I actually been up to Mount Charleston a few times. Mount Charleston's beautiful. It's beautiful up there. It's very, very serene up there too. I uh, I've been, I've stayed up there in the summer, of course, not in the winter. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, and I I just like I did a couple of the hikes there. Um, and I realized how out of shape I am. So, <laughs> so I made yeah. the mistake of going um in the middle of summer. I didn't bring a jacket or anything, so just you know, short sleeved shirt, and yeah. I got there and I was like low 50s i'm like Ooh, well well not a, a good choice no but there's a hotel there and when you were talking about it was like that we are with 117 degree temperature yep. the air conditioner stopped working in the hotel because it was like they don't even get that hot up there um they were getting close to 100 up there wow that yeah. is yeah that's that's <laughs> that not was really brutal. something regularly no that was uh, that was it yeah um uh, okay <clears throat> what's your favorite vacation you've taken uh oh um i'm probably gonna highlight the one we took last uh last year with my girlfriend uh we went back to serbia to visit friends family and stuff like that but between that we went to amsterdam for a few days i've been to amsterdam a bunch of times so we explored the city a little bit and then we visited uh, one of my favorite cities in the world and i've traveled quite a bit but out of all the places in the world that i've been to there's only two that I kind of step foot and I'm like, yeah, I could live here like easily. Uh, one of them is Rome. Rome's um, really great. I've been to Rome. Yeah, it's great. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I've been to Rome in, in various stages of my life from like a super broke student to um, a less broke cigar owner yep. and anywhere in between. So um, very, very historic right it truly is an eternal city and i just like walking around I, I don't like doing touristy stuff like i'll just yeah obviously like let's go fontana di trevi like let's check out all these other things but like legitimately i just liked walking around and i think in those four or five days that we were there uh we walked something like 70 80 miles <laughs> it's a walking city um, yeah really, I yeah that. absolutely beautiful and and i love it like between the culture the food yeah uh, the other one is is a little spot um, in Mexico called Playa del Carmen, um, which if you've never been, um, if you if you guys have ever experienced Santa Barbara, I think Santa Barbara except in Mexico, like the vibe. Okay. Um, lots of expats, uh, very 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 beautiful, great food, um, beautiful beautiful sea slash beach. Um, you have Cozumel right across the right across the. Uh, Right, take a little ferry over. Uh, very, very beautiful, and I could easily see myself, you know, sitting on a beach eating tacos. And I've done that multiple times. But those would be my two top like choices. Good, good places. Good places. I heard Montenegro is a, a great vacation spot in the Balkans. Is that true? Uh, it is. I've I've lived there. Uh, yeah. for about two and a half years. Um, it is, and. Uh, <laughs> It's a very uh, seasonal place, especially mm. down on the on the, on the coast. And, yeah, uh, I remember I remember asking this this local where I'm like, "Hey, what do you guys do here in in November?" <laughs> and the answer was mostly get depressed. <laughs> so I was kind of <laughs> taken aback, and I'm like, "What do you mean?" So the first year I was there, it rained 27 days out of 30, <laughs> and it was it was just miserable. Um, 
but we did we did make the best of it. Um, we did free breath diving, grabbed some uh, grabbed some wetsuits, went spear fishing, had fun. Like you know, still went to the restaurant, like managed that. But it was it was just miserable having rain for like literally a full month, like nonstop. Oh boy, um, it is beautiful in the summer. The the beaches in the sea in general are not as great. I think Croatia is better in, in that regard. Uh, Greece obviously blows it out of the water, um, but from a from a uh, environment standpoint, like just the the scenery, it's really really beautiful. Uh, very easy to traverse as well because I think the whole coastline is something like 70, 80 miles, if that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of. Uh, it's easy to get to some really historic places like Dubrovnik. Uh, you know, uh, one of the few cities that has never been ransacked through its entire history, super, you know, super old city, um, historically a, a big trading city that kind of did the smart move as opposed to everybody else in the world where whenever a new power rose up, they basically said, cool, what does it cost? Here's the, whatever your piece is, just let us do our thing. Right. And uh, true enough, that's kind of what they did. Uh, Kotor is also super, super beautiful. Uh, a very historic city in the in Kotor Bay, uh, very 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 magical. And then uh, Budva and the uh, Aman Sveti Stefan, which are you know old historic cities uh, dating back hundreds of years that are mo more or less untouched and you know lived lived in day to day. So very very beautiful. Montenegro is beautiful. That's what I've heard. Yeah, I've heard a lot yeah. about it lately. All right, a musical instrument that you don't play that you'd like to maybe learn to play. So I've. That is the one thing that I just, uh, I wish I had any kind of musical talent. Um, right. The last time I did karaoke, uh, it was a group of friends right. and my buddy approached me and said, um, I think I sang every rose has its thorn. Right. <laughs> so uh, he goes, Hey man, uh, you do requests. And I'm kind of like, yeah, man, well, you know, what do you have in mind? <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was like, all right, a little dejected, but uh, yeah, I, I have no absolutely no musical talent. If anything, I would I wish uh, I could learn how to play probably guitar, uh, but I've just resigned myself to that's just not for me. My oh. it just doesn't work. Yeah, I I tried guitar, it didn't work. I went to bass. Bass is a little easier, um, but I got bored of it. So uh, actually, I'll take that back. I'd love to learn how to play piano. Um, that is that is something that probably I'll never do. Is just. I'm I'm well aware of my uh, lack of talent in that area. Un understood. I'm not much. I'm not better. So, all right. The next question: a pet that you would like to have besides a dog or cat? A flamingo. I never got that <laughs> answer. But I got bird, but never a flamingo. Uh, no, I I really love flamingos, and uh, in fact, I have I have two, and they sometimes show up on 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 lives and in podcasts and stuff like that. Primarily, um, I I have those two for for. So one of the tests of our relationship is right. Uh, the first time we ever went to Costco together, and right. we made this list. Right, I'm like, cool, like this is what we're going to do. We have this whole list, like we're gonna stick to it. I walked in, and the first thing I saw, the moment you walk through the doors, was this stack of flamingos. Um, on the left side, and I just like went off the list and just grabbed it and and just went from there. So I love flamingos. Uh, for for a couple, of, right? It's such a piece of Americana that uh, someone is an immigrant, right? Like you just you don't see plastic flamingos or metal flamingos in in Europe. You just really don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the birds themselves are are incredibly uh incredibly interesting because they can live in some of the most inhospitable places in the world and just kind of chill they're like hey this is like super toxic and acidic but they're like yeah cool we're just gonna sit here and and you know enjoy um but yeah i'd probably love to have a flamingo uh when i was down in dominican republic at one of these resorts there was a random flamingo um uh, starting around for basically every day of the stay and um i still don't know what the name of the flamingo is was it a boy or a girl i don't right, know right. I I've asked multiple people and I've, and I've heard like seven different stories. So I just resigned to like, it's the flamingo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. Uh, this looks scar question. Uh, if there's one thing you'd like to change about the cigar industry, what would it be? Hmm. Uh, huh. 
that's a really good question. I actually haven't really thought about it. Um, it's, um, you, yeah, no, I actually threw this in to this question for the first time. So you're getting this one for the first time. Um, huh. In fact, I, if anything, I would, I would probably love if the cigar industry as a whole, and I got to preface this, that this isn't a critique. This is right. more of like, right, like wishful thinking. Um, I always look at the alcohol industry and the spirits industry in general and what they have done in terms of recognition and kind of skating by when it comes to all these regulations and stuff like that. And they also realize that um, they're not necessarily fighting over the same piece of the pie because they can build a bigger pie. So we have, if I remember the data from, I think it was 2019, it was something like 2% of the population enjoys uh right? At least like one premium cigar a year, I believe, or something along those lines. So mm -hmm. if we could change that from 2% to 4%. Um, you double it. Would, yeah. But yeah. That would be right. Like just build a bigger pie. It, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be, no one has to have a bigger piece. Yeah. You can keep the same piece. It just, if we grow the pie by two yeah. X, then everybody, everybody gets a, yeah, that, that would probably be it. Just grow a bigger yeah. pie and get the, get the legislation off our backs. Nice, yeah. nice. All right, and last question of the night. If you had a reality show about you, what would the title of that reality show be? Bold and bold, like B-O-L-D and B-O-L-D. <laughs> well, well, yeah. B and B for go. short. <laughs> I like and it. I, I already have it. Like, it would be all about the, uh, right, like all about the experience. It would focus on... Um, Food, cigars, wine, spirits, uh, coffee, tea. It would just be an experience-driven one. Um, I like watches. Like uh, Ideally, I would like to get into like vintage cars and horses because apparently, and then maybe a winery as well, but that would be kind of like exploration of the, the uh, Epicurean lifestyle. Let's call it that. Like, yeah, hey, yeah. we just let's interview interesting people who who have taken a bigger chunk of life than life has taken out of them. Sure. Very good. Well, Vlad, right. that's awesome. And right. not only that, you're the first person who actually described what the show would be. So, yeah. I'm able to get, <laughs> so I was really impressed with that. I haven't given it thought, but it would basically be like, hey, if you can imagine – Winston Churchill, Anthony Bourdain, and you know that kind of profile overall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People who have definitely taken a bigger yeah. chunk out of life than life has taken out of them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. great. All right, Vlad, I want to thank you very much for being on the show tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. Great conversation. I, I do want to follow up with you on on a follow up show with that as well. So absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of. Uh, I'm gonna very... give myself a preliminary pat on the back. For there that. you go. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we, hey, we we'll appreciate. I, I mean, appreciate getting to know you, uh, the friendship, and uh, like I said, uh, keep up the great work. Um, I'm really uh, happy to, you know, happy to get to know you and everything. So, thank you. Likewise, thank you for uh, for for the wonderful uh, interview in the show, and you know, thank you to the listeners for for tuning in, and you know, yay, you guys will get to. Suffer for another one of these next time I'm back. Not, so. not at looking all. Looking forward to it. <laughs> not at all. All right, Vlad, you uh, you you take care. Uh, by the way, Vlad was doing the show in the wind, and uh, I didn't hear one bit of wind with that microphone. So, yeah, and you didn't see it either. So, <laughs> oh, great stuff. All right, Vlad, you take care, and uh, we'll we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Looking forward right. to it. Thanks for Thanks, having Vlad. me. Take care. All right. So that's Vlad uh, Stojnevic of uh, of some cigars. Uh, so, Aaron. Yes. Uh, we got one more segment. I'm going to quiz you on what you thought of PCA. Okay. Uh, so we'll get your point of view because we, we did the show Monday night, so we're not going to do a whole recap. But right. I want to get your thoughts on a few things. But before we do that, we got to get into uh, – our This Day in Sports History brought to you by Espinosa Cigars, makers of award-winning blends, brands such as Knuckle Sandwich, 601, and what? I just brain farted here. I guess because I don't have the thing in front of me. Uh, makers, <laughs> makers of Espinosa 601 and Knuckle Sandwich Cigars. Hey. Sorry, Hector. Uh, smoke Espinosa, smoke Espinosa every day and get into a Lazona state of mind. Boy, how did I brain fart on Espinosa? Oh, by the way, uh, 
Now, Aaron, you won't be here next week. Uh, you have some Correct. travel. Uh, and but we will have Eric Espinosa on next week. Perfect. So, um, and uh, I will have someone I think co-hosting. It's a TBD. Um, so yeah, you stay tuned. Um, and next next couple weeks we're around the seven year anniversary, so we will do something you and I with the seven year anniversary when you get back. So okay, uh, perfect. We won't forget about you with the seven years. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Eric Espinosa is scheduled for next week, so I think that's all confirmed right now. Uh, we'll Good. do a nine o'clock start time with that one too. So okay. All right, Aaron. So here's your here is the boy. I, how did I mess that one up? All right. So on this day, April fourth, nineteen ninety seven, mm-hmm. this stadium made its major league debut. It made its debut for Major League Baseball. Okay. What is that stadium? Uh, <laughs> this is going to be uh post. Olympics Turner Field is this correct? That is correct. That was the key word. Is it? It wasn't the stadium that made its debut. It made its debut. They retrofitted it for uh, right. Yep. Yep. Yes. Have you have you been to? Were you ever to Turner Field? No, I've never been to Atlanta. You never. Oh wow. Um. Yeah. It was very interesting how they they had a they used to have an exhibit there that they showed the how they transformed the stadium, which was very interesting because it was like an open like. One end was open on it, right? Yeah, Something like that. Yeah, it was for they did they do track and field in there and all that stuff. It was the main, yeah, it was the main Olympic yeah. stadium that they built for the Olympics because they didn't right. have uh, really something that they can use yeah. uh, for that. Um, they had uh, the Georgia Dome, but that wasn't really conducive for like an Olympic stadium. So yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So they they did that, but yeah, it was, uh, and it's one of the shortest stadiums ever. Um, like that stadium only lasted about twenty years. And then they they ended up you know moving obviously uh, yeah there's like there's been some stadiums that felt felt to me like they didn't last very long there's another stadium that uh, the Alamo Dome seemed like it didn't have a long run either no and it was no. supposed to be like this like it was supposed to be like a like this structural like like experimental thing that they did that was you know and it just didn't seem like it lasted long no it didn't it didn't um at all it's it's uh. I like I said, but Atlanta, those two, I, I think, were twenty years, and that's it. Yeah, um, that's, that's short for a stadium. Yeah, that is short. Usually, it's a thirty-five to forty-year run they try to get out of a stadium. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, um, you know, the vet, the vet was about thirty-five years. Mm. The old veteran stadium was about thirty-five years. Um, and I guess you're gonna have a. Uh, you're gonna have a, another team uh, yeah. uh, near you. I, it, <laughs> is is Sacramento closer to you than than Oakland, or are they it's a little you? further away? Okay. Uh, and the draw, but the drawback with Sacramento is there's no like Oakland. You could take the BART train, right? So I can catch the BART train like ten minutes from my house, and it takes me right to the stadium. You got. So I don't have to drive it. if I didn't want to. Uh, but with Sacramento, that doesn't. I, it doesn't really work that way. Um. And this stadium, like this is a minor league ballpark that they're going yeah. to. So, I mean, based on the number of fans they're pulling, it's still not going to fill it up. But, um, yeah, it's going to be a much more intimate kind of, you know, I'd be curious. I'm curious to go um, just to see what it's like, you know, watching two major league teams in a minor league ballpark. I, I, I'm assuming it's going to be like similar like spring training. Kind of a that's, vibe. What, that's what I would say. Um, you know, I've been to a couple of AAA and AA stadiums. It's a very intimate experience. It may not be the worst thing in the world for the fans, believe it or not. Um, unless well, you're, yeah, unless you have a completely different fan base that's now going to have a major league team, yeah, in their backyard, right? Yeah. So it, they, I think they'll see a boost from it for sure. I've heard something, even like the city of Sacramento w- went for it because they're maybe looking to see if they can audition for a team at some point. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, California is losing a team, so yeah, um, that that you know that. Only, I mean, that's happened, you know, recently with the the Raiders, uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, but Oakland's lost all their teams, yeah. so they lost the Raiders, they lost the A's, they lost the Warriors. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, I know. You know, uh, I didn't realize in Vegas this was the last weekend of the Tropicana when we were there, yes. and I heard it on the news yeah. that it was closing. It closed on Tuesday, and they were. It was a, um. Apparently, what I heard is they were getting four hundred dollars a night for rooms there. People wanted to go back there. Uh, oh, really? Uh, for cent- it, I've been in the. I've actually stayed in the Tropicana. It's the the casino is beautiful. The rooms were terrible. Is the problem? Yeah. 
that was always the problem with the Tropicana. Um, yeah. The, the rooms were never up to standards, but the casino it was really beautiful inside, actually. Right. Uh, but yeah, apparently, uh, I didn't, I would have walked through it one more time. I haven't been there in about like 15 years. So, um, but I did, I did. What was that? I didn't say anything. I heard, what was that? I don't know. Did you hear for, something? I heard for a clip. Oh, no. I heard like someone else in here. It was weird. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> it was just me and you. I don't know if we're getting hacked or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. Uh, that, that yeah. So I meant to ask Vlad about that. I should have asked him about that too. If he, but um, mm. but yeah. So that, but um, yeah. I saw the I saw the rendering of the stadium and everything. Um, it, it's gonna be tight from what I heard parking wise. Uh, too. Like you're gonna yeah. have to basically park all the places in Vegas and take the take transportation down there. Right. Yeah, I think you could take the monorail down to the MGM, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's another monor. There's a short monorail between like Mandalay Bay and the Ex Excalibur, is okay. the other one. So we'll see. All right, so let me just read the last sponsor things. We'll get into that final segment here. So first, uh, I want to mention J.C. Newman Cigar Company, founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman. J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 127 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 113-year-old cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District of Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as Elver Hole, J.C. Newman does premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique cigar machines, including the All-American Cigar, the American, and the Angel Cuesta. The J.C. Newman Pensive Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua. It's where Brickhouse, Pearl de Mar, El Baton, Quorum, and Yago cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond cigars are handmade by Tobacco A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newman's founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, health care, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has five generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of the Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now the Cuevas family has brought their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. You can try the Casa Cuevas uh, line as well as the Cuevas Reserva line. And uh, the latest release, the uh, La Mandaria Oscuro. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas Cigars from our casa to yours. And we're going to get to our Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust Industry Deliberation segment, sponsored by Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. There's no deliberation when it comes to Dunbarton's track record since launching in 2015. This has included nine consecutive top three appearances on the half consensus, including number one cigar of the year in 2020 with the Mi Corita Tricky Traca, and again in 2022 and 2023 with the Mi Corita Black. Visit DTT Cigars to find a purveyor that carries the brands of Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. You know, we didn't do this year the gathering at Steve's booth this year. Oh, you didn't do the part, part wrap, of wrap the, it up there? Yeah, but part, here was part of the reason why we didn't do it. Uh, one, we were hungry. But the other thing was Steve was doing the watch raffle. Yeah. So it was okay. like packed. There was like no place yep. to go this yep. year to, to kind of do it. So we, this is the first year we did not do the – we kind of met by the booth, but we just ended up going because right. – uh, it was just it was it was it was like everyone was trying to win that watch and that was what yeah. the drawing was so okay. so we didn't get to do that this year uh we were, and we were really all hungry too so yeah uh because it was a full day so uh so Aaron what I wanted to do here is you did a great show on Monday night folks didn't check out Aaron's show uh uh you did a great job at like really for a guy who wasn't at the show you really had a pulse of what was going on the show yeah thank you I, but, yeah I tried, it was more. You know me trying to collect information, so it was yeah. kind of a, a different way to look at it from what I know normally view it. Yeah. So I'm quizzing you tonight. I have some questions for you. Um, okay. I think you may have seen the questions, so there's no surprises here. Um, and I want to kind of just get your thoughts of someone who kind of was on the sidelines. I know necessarily you were doing some other stuff, so maybe it wasn't like you were home sitting sitting by, right. but I'm sure you were interested in the happenings here. Yes. And I wanted to kind of get your opinion. I'm sure you made some some uh. Some some judgment calls here. So right, all right. So my first question is, you know, the PCA trade show has drama. Yeah. Was there enough drama this year for you at the PCA trade show? From what you heard, yeah, I mean, uh, so what I the, my kind of the way I was digesting information was um, kind of our internal chat that we yep. normally have and hearing things kind of going on there. 
Um, and then just kind of viewing things maybe uh, from Facebook or browsing around some other websites. Right. Um, so the only real drama I kind of got from it was uh, the whole media early in, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say early entry. That's not the right term. The media entry just yeah. was a problem, right? Yeah. So that was a big deal. Um, it was, it was. We've run into that many times. It seems like it, you know, like the, there's one year where it worked out and then like, it's been a problem ever, you know, every other time. So, but that just needs to be, I think, handled. Um, I think the uh, the opening reception uh, eats were. Uh... I didn't kill. The, I didn't kill the nachos as bad as the, how about the cigar guys did. <laughs> right, <way>. right. Um, <laughs> like I at least what I was killing the nachos on Monday night. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I could say that I really saw that there was much more drama than that those, um, were, the, those were probably the two big things yeah um there were a couple of personnel things i don't want to get into those too much but right they okay. were minor uh and you really had a no it being a no at that yeah i didn't hear about any like fights yeah. or near fights or anything like that no so, no yeah. i didn't hear okay. uh no one got fired uh so <laughs> that i know of right. so um I will say just I did re write to the PCA. They did respond to me um, mm -hmm. on the whole media thing. Um, so I think as far as I'm concerned, it it's behind me, but it's kind of going to be show me next year. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we and I think we just will need to kind of beat that drum leading up to the trade show next year just yeah. to – yeah. Try to make it so that's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So they did respond back to me. Uh, I wrote that email before the show Monday. I got the response the next day. Um, and I'll just say, you know, they did chalk it up to miscommunication. I'll just kind of leave it at that. But, uh, you know, there's still some questions on how that happened. It's still mm -hmm. beyond me. But um, as far as I'm concerned, they did respond and I did appreciate the response. So right. uh, and it wasn't it wasn't unsatisfactory uh, either. But um it's still it still should have never happened. So that's just yeah. kind of yeah. All right. So you were kind of touching on this a bit. You you you're a guy who didn't go to the trade show, so you're relying. Forget the chat for a second. The media cover. Yeah. yeah. All right. Was the media coverage adequate for you this year? Um. See, it's hard for me to like because I'm not normally consuming it. Right. Right. Um. But did you feel like okay? I didn't I see found a out ton of it. I yeah. didn't see a ton of it beating me over the head. Um, you know, I saw a lot more leading up to the show, obviously, because the people that are yeah. that our targets are there, so they're not going to be um, really, you know, trying to reach people at that point. But um, uh, I don't know. It's probably not what I would expect. Maybe um, you know, I just. You know, the, the traditional, I'm smoking a cigar at this booth. Uh, I got this funny video. Um, I'm That's doing this kind of, interview. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's not, I don't think it's, I'm a good barometer of that yeah. because that's not what I'm interested in. Really. Right, right. I mean, uh, I thought, I thought considering the half wheel guys were kind of shorthanded and I thought they did a decent, really good job, actually. I will say that that was a, that was a huge departure from their normal coverage. Yeah, um, it was a huge departure, but I was satisfied with it. You know, uh, they still gave me plenty of information, and they seemed like they didn't do as much wrapper bind to fill it this year. Um, yeah, I actually like that, though. So I like that, uh, too, yeah. For me, it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. like there's a lot of stuff that wasn't that hasn't been covered. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, like, I get a little pushback from people saying, you're not doing enough wrapper bind to fill it. Like, uh, I got, you know... And I said, well, the company just weren't disclosing stuff this year. It was very, I mean, I could tell you CLE wasn't dis uh, closing stuff. There's other booths that were very much in that boat. They were just keeping it close okay. to the close to the vest this year. Um, so we, we just did what we could do, basically. Yeah. Um, so, all right, well, this will lead into the third question here. Was there something you heard about exhibited at the trade show that you would really like to have seen this year? Because you've seen some uh, really stuff out there. Um, so I would have liked to have seen the, uh, Tatuaje hand roll thing. It was so really good. Not, not really a cigar thing. But I would like to have seen that. It, 
it was really I, I would wonder if you would have got the tear in your eye in one scene. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> but but Maybe. I actually want but you would have I think you would have appreciated it for sure. Yep. So definitely yeah. I I I just I like the style that they're that they're doing for these. Yeah. Um and there's so many opportunities in the cigar industry because there's so many good stories. Um that it, you know, if it can continue, I think that would be great for the industry. Only problem is is that I think the audience is kind of small for it because it's just the people that are into cigars but yeah if you could somehow get it to like wh widen the the viewer base that'd be that'd be a really good thing the, um the pete thing let me say something on that yeah it had that it had that espn 30 for 30 vibe to it okay and the first hour was all about pete's early life so that's what it. was so unique about it, which think you didn't know a lot of this stuff. Right. The JC one was really good, but we knew a lot of the stuff that went on sure. with that. But this one I thought was the best one. I think you would have liked this one. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, definitely that. Um, I think the rest of the those pre events and uh you know, I, I'm okay with uh, maybe not seeing them. You um, I think you would have liked the La Aurora one, Aaron. They were focusing a lot on flavor with that one. Okay. Maybe, so yeah. I think that one you I, yeah the Nick one was more of a history lesson but but the yeah. Manuel and Noah is actually was focusing a lot on flavor which I thought was good with that right yeah okay. cool um I think I would like to have seen the Drew Estate booth because I heard that was pretty interesting yeah um and uh, the Placencia booth just kind of see what the layout looks like because they're talking about this modular booth that they can use in different places so I'm just kind of curious yeah from a design standpoint what that what that would look like um. And then I think just kind of based on the cigars that I knew about prior, go, you know, kind of checking the, those out because, you know, you had um, a submit like our top five yeah. impact cigars and stuff like that. So those would all be things that I, wa that I wanted to check out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, every year there's a, the cigars I'm excited about that I want to go check out. So it's not like I'm yeah. ever going into the trade show be like... Well, there's nothing here I really want to see, but I'm gonna go anyway and just see what happens. It's, yeah, that's not the case. There's always cigars that, um, that I have an interest in, um, just to see kind of how they play out, um, see what the because, and then you go to the show and then you hear buzz as people smoke stuff, and then you'll get you know it may be not a cigar that you were like high on going in, but people are saying, hey, you got to go check this out, or there's this yeah. brand that you got to go check this brand out. You know, I talked to this guy that I never met before. He's pretty cool. You go meet him. So, um, yeah, th those are all the those are all the fun things about the trade show that I missed this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this the JRE stuff actually was kind of the stuff I'm wondering what you're gonna think when that smokes when you smoke it. Yeah. Um, so I smoked Fuminoche. I did not smoke the Cameron. wasn't ready. Okay. Um, or at least I didn't get one. But um, and then you know you heard everyone talking about the Macanudo. Um. Right. Well, most of the guys on the coop team really liked the Macanudo. Nielsen okay. was the only one who didn't. Right. But uh, but we we'll, you know, we'll see. Um. Um, with that and uh, and then the uh the other thing that was pretty cool was the Flint and Old guy was there. Aaron, so he was there as well. Yeah, I would like to meet him because he he and I are local to each other, and yeah, you know, so um, yeah, yeah. No, Any I agree. Answer? I agree. All right, so this is a multi-part question. So okay. what did the PCA accomplish? Um, there's, there's three things that they changed this year. I want to see how well they accomplished. Okay. Did they accomplish their objective? First of all, moving to the spring. Do you think, based on what you heard, moving to the spring was a good idea? Um, I don't know that I've heard enough feedback one way or the other that it's a good idea or a bad idea. I mean, some of the people that we've talked to, you know, pre-show, you know, are – like the timing uh i've always said that this is a better time just because you want to get the cigars to come in before summer yep so that you can sell through for those areas that are not like year-round uh bonanzas um so um for me i think it's still good the, the first year you're not going to be able to judge it well because people That's have what a I short felt. window to get this yeah. the cigars ready next year see next year it throws a different wrinkle into it next year is now we got a year window to do it, but now we're changing cities and there's, you know, so it seems like they're ne they never can have like the right scenario. So if it was, if it was next year again in Vegas, you could really kind of say, all right, now we're, now we're just talking about the day, the time of the year, right? Yeah. There's no other real factors in here in play. So we could really judge it based on time of the year. 
So that's not going to really get to play. So they're going to throw New Orleans in it. So it, it could be one or it could be the other kind of thing. But I think I think it will be good. Yeah, I, I think um it's an incomplete. I've heard one show say they thought it was great. Like they thought it was a home run. I heard another show a little more along the lines of what we said. Um, but I was surprised how many cigars are shipping in the next then in April and May. That was a surprise to me. They yeah. seemed like they had they were a little more, and I don't know if it was you could chalk it up to people held back releases. That may because it was very like there was a very light winter season of releases, like you know towards the end of the year. Yes, and and you know if you were, like I know you I've been talking to you. It's been harder to find some new cigars because it was, so I think a lot of stuff might have shifted. Uh, is why that stuff's ready. I think next year it'll be on a better cycle. So I think you'll see. It'll I would be think better. so. Yeah. 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 How about the move to the Las Vegas Convention Center? Um, the convention itself, I don't think matters. Uh, what? where the location is, like the function of the of the trade show floor, uh-huh. it's all the things that are around it. Right, uh, and that's I mean, all for, cool. the other me. things around it. Yeah, because we talked to you know we talked to Steve and we talked to Mike on the show Monday, and they're talking about you know how the ins and outs of like set up and tear down stuff like that that there may be a difference there but that's not really stuff that's kind of on our radar um but for me i don't care about where the, the trade show floor once you're on the trade show floor right I, I don't see a big difference in the layout between those two the the two places but the um the sands being part of the venetian and palazzo makes it really easy for a lot of people that are staying there to just stay within the facility and do what they need to do. Las Vegas Convention Center has to have travel, breaks up the groups a little bit. So that could be good, could be bad. But um so yeah, I if you get if I had to choose one, I'd say the sands. Just because it's it's easier for a lot of people. That that would just be my thing. I heard less complaints though this this time. I remember when they moved in 17. Yeah. I think the Westgate, which was going undergoing those renovations, was a big issue. Right. Um, we were already had moved into a media compound by that point. So, but I think Resorts World was generally positively received. Uh, the only complaint I heard was the Tesla being out that one day, but it wasn't a terrible thing. And it seemed like this this Bagel Mania place became like the morning meat place, which was kind of interesting mm. too. Um. So, but yeah, it wasn't quite as bad as 17 when it was just massive. And then they had, that's the year they had the norovirus too. If you, and yes. the fire and all that. So the fire was a year after. The fire was a year after. It was, the fire was 18. The norovirus, yeah. I think, was 17. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but there was no catastrophe that I saw uh, this year with that. And then here's the last one. I'm, this is the one I'm most curious. What's your thoughts? What do you feel about the elimination at a half day? Um, I like the half day. Yeah, um, but the, 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 it, the, did the show accomplish what you think? Yeah, what? Yeah, um, I think that they probably did. Um, because I, I don't think that they, I don't think there's enough attendance to warrant that fourth day, that half day, right? No, um, they had to get rid of it. I think. Yeah, yeah I think it. You know now. There's a lot of stuff behind that, you know. They, if they're breaking down, um, can they get what they need to do, get done that evening, or does it, you know, does it bleed over to the next day? Yeah. If, are they are they actually like saving themselves money by you know eliminating the half day? So if they if they are, then sure, that's it's a it's a good deal. Um, but I think what we're, I think what we may be seeing is that this is really a two day show. In regards to the retailers, um, I've you know, always that they, felt they'll, that yeah. they'll have to argue that you know to see is that true or not true. I know because people like Jay said, you know, he needs, you know, he was using as much time as he had allotted to him to be able to do business, which I can completely understand that. I mean, us on the media side, we love that extra half day because we have that right. fourth day the, the floor is dead. We get all the access to people that we want that are still there, all that kind of stuff. So. There are, I'm sure there are people that use every minute they have available to them. But then you have, you know, as we see the the attendance trail off after day two, clearly there's a 
there's a decent amount of people that are only using the two days. So there's going to, you know, it'll, it'll, I think it'll continue to go, but you'd have to see what it would look like if the dates were changed where it wasn't crossing a weekend. Right. Yeah. Or if they were all weekdays, what does it look like then? Do people have more flexibility to stay all three days because maybe the week, you know, You'd have to see how it goes. Yeah, I think you're right. I think well, the last day I think we talked about this Monday, the first hour and a half was like dead. No one, no one showed up at nine. Yeah, right. And then four o'clock, there was a lot of breakdown going on. Yeah. Oh, uh, there was still. It wasn't quite a ghost town feel at four. It was more of a ghost right. town feel at nine. The nine o'clock was like no one was there. No one, no one wanted to come in at nine. Oh so, yeah, I mean what? Yeah, once you've got a day. You know, once people are in Vegas for a night or the second night, yeah, you know, the first night they're like, "I'm gonna be good." Yeah, on this trip, I'm gonna be good. I'm not gonna do it. Uh, and then they they do it. They're good the first night, and then every, then the 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 pressure of Vegas comes in, and they're like, "Fuck it, <laughs> I'm gonna do. It. I'm gonna go out." And then it, you know, day three, it's yeah, yeah. The, the, they they forgot why they decided they were they should have been good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I heard Mitchell just put a comment about the food inside. We we don't have a chance to eat ever, but uh, that's why we were yeah. so hung. Yeah. Um, they had the Dunkin' Donuts coffee place, which was pretty cool outside. They were uh, th- they were nice people who were running okay. that. Got to nice. give them a little shout out. Um, but yeah, I think um, I agree with all the. I think if they actually if they can get this to a Friday to Sunday, it would be better. They'll mitigate a lot of that. The other thing yeah. is, I think Jay could kind of correct me. I think they had a breakdown. If I think they had to stop the show at five. For whatever reason, I think if they went to six, it was a problem. But yeah. I think if they would have went to six, you would have just had two hours of, of ghost town. So right. I, I think the nine to five was fine with me that that last day. Maybe they'll end up making it ten to five going forward. But um, yeah, but yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, I think you know, I think they had to get rid of that half day. Yeah, yeah. All right. And the last question is: If you have one advice for the PCA moving to New Orleans, what do they need to do? What's a piece of advice you can give them that they that they absolutely have to do? Mm. That's tough. See, I don't know. I don't know that there's anything that they have to do. Um, I think the, they got to figure the central location out. At yeah, night. I mean, it, that's going to be a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it for a city that's so anti-smoking. Yes, but. I just think there's so many variables that could make it so it doesn't work. Yep. Cause you don't, I mean, you're not going to find, at least my understanding, you're not going to find a place like they had at resorts world where you're going to sit, be able to sit around and smoke and drink. Right. Yeah. Um, so people aren't going to find this hidden gem somewhere. I wouldn't think. Um, and the cigar shops there aren't really big enough to host something that's of decent size. But I mean, if they can find this spot, I'm just curious about accessibility to whatever location they find right yeah how close is it to the convention center how close is it it to where most of the people are staying like if it's close enough to those things and the weather you know obviously the weather's gonna be far better than it was in 2015 when we were there um well as long as it's not like raining or yeah or hurricaning or whatever that's the only thing i'm a little concerned is is new orleans could get rainy uh at night that may be the only drawback of having a house this year yeah but i mean if you got if they've they've got those if they've got tents or whatever is going on then that's going to be not be as big a deal because you could have tents but if it's you know 90 90 nobody's having a good time yeah so yeah exactly um so we'll see yeah i think you know i like that place we went to hemingways it was a little out of the way though was the only problem but that, that's I, I liked it a lot. Uh, it did get really smoky in there, but we had a good group um, yeah. that was there. Um, yeah. It was kind of right down there um, yeah. by Bourbon Street and stuff like that. Yeah. So it was, that was nice. It was it was a um, cab ride, but it was not bad. Um, yeah. That seemed like where people were congregating at night uh, yeah. as far as cigar places went. Uh, yeah. That and Don Lienzo, uh those were the two. Um, but we didn't go to Don Lienzo, We went to Hemingway's, and I thought that place was pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think we'll have like when we figure our compounds, um, we're gonna have to make sure we have covered patio. I think that's gonna be the one thing we're gonna have to right. Wait. Yeah. So, all right. That's all I got, Aaron. That was good job. All right. So, so uh, yeah, next week, um, stay tuned. Uh, Eric Espinosa, Aaron, I know you're traveling next week. Safe yep. travels. Thank you. Um, you'll be missed. Uh, um, but uh, we'll be thinking of you in spirit as always. Um, and Monday night we have another jukebox show. 
Uh, <laughs> Dave Burke's come up with another cool concept. You know that Oliva cigar that had the QR code? Yep. Yep. We're gonna be doing a take of that on different okay. cigars, building playlists with that. So got it. Okay. Uh, as, as much as I hate QR codes, uh, I actually <laughs> had fun doing this one. So so stay yeah. tuned on that one as well. Um, and uh, stay tuned for Coop. We're starting to roll the Coop content out. So we yeah, yeah. uh, the some of the Coop. We've had a lot of challenges on the Coop team in the last week and a half. So <laughs> everyone's right. had their challenges, but we're getting it out. So uh, uh, but we're starting to roll it out. So we have a ton of shit. So yeah. Um, I know you guys have contributed some stuff for us too. John had a lot of pictures. We thank you right. as well. Uh, John had a good. John was an honorary member, but he was developing pallets. Uh, representing yeah. you guys very well. Very nice. All right. Anyway, that's going to wrap up primetime episode 301 into the annals of history for this Thursday, April 4th, now Friday, April 5th on the East Coast. We'll catch everybody next time. Take care, everybody. See you guys.